cool. Welcome to the uh, third uh, Weird Patchworks workshop. Uh, it's an interesting experience. We try not to uh, build up too much of perception ahead of time. So we'll just let you guys flow through it and uh, develop your own patches as we move through. We have uh, four speakers today. Uh, one of them will be dialing in, but we also have some uh, previous guests jumping in on the Hangout. So you'll see some of their interaction from Michael James uh, and Xenogoth. Um, for the first speaker, we have uh, Paul Cheney, who's going to introduce to you um, a little bit of a, a simulation farming experiment. I'm standing right in front of the speaker. And uh, sorry. he'll be uh, giving that simulation. Mics are down. <laughs> okay. Mics are down. Okay, we have a lift off. Uh, so Paul will be uh, starting off with Uh, methodology. Um, instead of schema today, we are in communication right now, uh, but we'll move on to that. You can uh, mark your alarm and, and ring for the uh, And then today also will be uh, Seb Trump. And he'll be closing up with a, a little bit of a salvaging uh, fun exercise for that. If you're not familiar with how uh, Patchworks has usually gone, we uh, give some presenters uh, opportunities to present uh, some of the background to what a patchwork is, how you get through it. Um, and then sometimes they've also produced some kind of model for a patchwork, so we'll go through that. Um, if you have any questions, uh, be, be, uh, be active, reach out. You can go through Twitter, you can go uh, reach out to us on the site uh, and get questions in there. Uh, between each, we will probably not open up questions, but save them all for the end to have a big panel opening up. Um, and then following the entire um, workshop, there will also be some music being put on afterwards, so you can stick around for that as well. Um, if you follow it on YouTube, go ahead and comment on YouTube, uh, and then jump in as, as usual. Um, I won't give any further uh, introduction to that, I'll let it sit with that. Um, there is uh, some other infrastructure things to go over. We have a pirate box sitting in here, so if you want to also upload and download things from this pirate box, uh, just log in through your typical Wi-Fi and just find the pirate box in your Wi-Fi. Um, but if not, there's plenty of Wi-Fi to go through. Um, but other than that, uh, go ahead and reach out to any one of us standing behind over here, behind shaping and, and whatnot, and uh, we're going to get started. Thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Okay. Um, is that all right yeah. if I... S is it coming okay. through all right? Um, recording. Is that all yeah. right if I... S okay. So, um, through, thank all right. you very much for the invitation. Yeah. Okay. So, um, thank you very much um, for I'm just going to start by reading a short text. To contribute. Um, um, so the, the I'm just going to start by reading a short text. Isn't, um, um, so the, is, the, isn't as it was my subject right? isn't, so um, it's, it's, and it's basically is, isn't called, as it was um, advertised, algorithmic actually, gardening. Right? But so uh, it changed it. And so it's basically the living called, surface of the planet um, algorithmic gardening. has been colonized and constrained by an anthropocentric system. So the living surface of the planet designed for maximum, been colonized and constrained by an anthropocentric food system. Our Designed for maximum, food system maximum extraction of profit under capitalism. Resilience. Our modern it's globalized food system operates to the detriment of the biosphere's and its native resilience. Sustainability. Its inherent stability Our through system, complexity. which now constitutes a large part of the biosphere's metabolism, of course, is on the verge of collapse for a multitude of reasons. The arguments for small-scale farming and localized food systems are clear. The United Nations reports and academic papers have been around for years showing how small-scale farming increases biodiversity, reduces carbon emissions from the agricultural sector, reduces agricultural pollution, encourages the preservation of valuable genetic legacies, and benefits the fabric of human society in many ways. Shortening the distance between the site of production and the site of consumption 
reducing individual farm size, creating locally diverse complex food systems, sequesters more carbon into the soil, reduces reliance on synthetic soil fertility, offers more Lebensraum to the, a larger variety and number of non-human, non-domesticated -dom beings, most importantly on the, the microbiotic level, and brings a greater degree of resilience and stability to human food systems. However, the techno-optimist bias within the agricultural industry continues to take things in the opposite direction. Despite the obvious finitude of synthetic soil fertility and fossil fuel-powered farming, agricultural systems continue to get bigger and inherently less stable. So, does weird patchworking have the potential to systematize resilient, lo-fi, heterogeneous food systems? And if so, how do we translate this patchwork theory into the clunky analog language and praxis of food production and food systems? Can the digital be appropriated to implement and manage localized food systems on a mass scale, somewhat answering the accelerationist critique of horizontality and the inability of folk movements to scale up? Can digitally implemented agricultural patchwork, patchworks address the dangerous homogenization of food systems? And basically, can the digital be reemployed to repair gaps in the fabric of human scale agricultural knowledge? So these are my questions, I guess, of the projects I'm going to show you. And I'm going to show you a few tools and um, artworks that I've been developing for a while, and also going to show a few online services that could perhaps be adapted for the patchworking cause. Um, so this is a quite nice little illustration which like covers all of that, really. Um, I have seen a version where there's a fourth model at the bottom here, which is just one big field of uh, maize or corn. And it doesn't support any wildlife. It's just a picture of babish here on the, on the right-hand side. So um, I've been interested in self-sufficiency in agriculture for a really long time. And um, I made a project in the UK, which I'll show you a few slides of. Um, to, to make a, a sort of an experiment in my own personal self-sufficiency. And when I was talking about uh, wanting to do this with friends, they were very critical of the whole idea, and they said to me, basically, um, uh, you know, I was being very selfish because there isn't enough land for everybody to be self-sufficient. And this just didn't figure in my head at all. And so I sort of set about trying to exactly work out how much land I would need as an individual to, to produce all of the food and fuel for myself in a low, low impact or low carbon way. Um, I couldn't find the data to support that. So I uh, designed uh, an app, um, which I didn't write the code myself, but I just did the concept of software to, to try and figure out exactly how much land one person needs. Um, and I'm going to run through this now. So this is called the field machine. Um, what you have here, and unfortunately the resolution's a little bit low to be able to see it clearly, but um, you have a selection of foods here. And in the back end of the app, which is browser-based, obviously, you can add um, as many different crops and different food types as you like. Uh, what you do is, moving the sliders up, you have to build a diet which conforms to World Health Organization recommendations for daily nutrition. So as I move these up, you can notice that these boxes here are changing color. So blue um, is not enough, green is obviously enough, red is too much, and you've got um, fat, protein, and carbohydrate. So for each crop, uh, this one here is wheat. As you move the slider up, it, go, it shows you how many grams you would need per day. You can, I'm sorry about the resolution. <laughs> you can't read it at all. Um, how many grams you need a day, how many um, grams that would be annually, uh, how much um, fat, protein, and carbohydrate that gives you in grams per day. Um, how, sorry, yeah, and the bottom one here, how many kilos per year, and then how many square meters of land that actually requires. Can I try enlarging, like so? Yeah. If you can, yeah, there we go. 
Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So you can see. Very good. Thanks. So let's try and make a balanced diet. Um, we've got too many calories at the moment, so let's cut down the wheat. Uh, we need more fat. We'll stick some some a few beans in there. We'll have some oil. Uh, okay, so that's a that's a balanced diet according to the WHO. There's no vegetables in there, but vegetables and fruits don't actually affect um, your calorie, protein, and fat intake very much at all. Obviously, you need them for, for vitamins and minerals. Um, and then what it does here is draw a little um, tree map diagram of how the land will be divided up. and gives you the total square meters of that food system. Um, if we, so this is a vegetarian diet. It's using um, 2,500 square meters. So let's uh, get rid of the rapeseed oil and let's take, get our fat intake from butter. Uh, we've added another f more or less 500 square meters onto the land that we need. Um, let's take away the beans and take away some of this so that we need a bit more protein and we'll put some um, beef or pork. Let's put pork because that's very Czech, right? Wow, need quite a lot. So there we go, 200 grams of pork a day. And we've got a balanced diet. But now we've used up 4,200 square meters. So it's a very useful little app for showing exactly the land use efficiency of different diets, comparing between the, um, omnivorous, vegetarian, and vegan um, modes of eating. So um, can we zoom back out again? And then maybe um, zoom into this part here, if possible. <laughs> this part here on the left. Yes. OK, perfect. So what it also does is um, we can, in the back end, we can set the land surface area or the land mass that we're modeling. We can put in the population. So for this one here, it's set up for the UK. That's the total um, hectares and that's the current population. And it shows us that if we're just restricting this diet to the UK landmass and, and modeling the UK population, we've just killed 10.8 million people. So you can, um, you can change the, in the back end, you can put any landmass, so you can like model your one garden, you can model a whole continent. There's a little feedback loop up here which shows how many square meters you would need to assign to growing biodiesel to make um, to, to grow um, sunflowers or rapeseed oil to make the biodiesel to power the machines for doing some of the basic agricultural um, operations in the field. And you also have to choose the size of your house. So if we give ourselves 40 square meters of accommodation. Um, then we can see that we need this amount of forest. The blue area represents the forest, so we need to grow this, this size of forest to actually keep your accommodation heated and to, um, to provide yourself with full fuel for cooking. And now with this diet, we've used 12,000 square metres, which means that we've killed 45 million people in the UK. So you can see the principle. It's like a, a useful tool for modelling very basic sort of parameters of, of um, dietary and fuel use with different biofuels. You can change the biofuel here as well from uh, native forest to more efficient forms of biofuel, which are like um, short rotation uh, coppice willow and um, mythan mythanthus grass and stuff like that. Um, are there any questions about that at this stage? Then you want to. Yeah, so this, this is only um, for this, in this particular instance of the software, and I'd like to expand this, of course. This is um, actually for straw bale house um, accommodation. So it's using heat loss calculations for straw bale house construction, and it's using the average um, ambient temperature of the UK in this case. Yeah. So obviously that would change if you were like in depending where you are near the. Like the better technologies and stuff like 
Exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And also co-housing and you know, all of these questions. I mean, obviously, there's a very, very simple ver uh, version of what could be possible to, with this kind of modelling. Um, so it uses, um, yeah, it uses two basic data sets. One is obviously the nutritional value of, of each food, which is based, uh, got very easily from USDA, has a very comprehensive data set on um, how many calories, uh, how much protein, how much fat there are in each particular food kind. And then, the, then it, it uh, uses yield data, which is a little bit more difficult to get. Um, so how many square meters... Of, of land you need to, um, to grow that, that, um, like 100 grams per meter, I think it's worked out on. Um, things like chicken are a little bit more difficult to calculate, because, or eggs, for example, because you have to then know how many square meters of corn and wheat you need to feed a chicken to make it lay one egg per day. So it's, like, it's quite a lot of um, number crunching going on in the back end of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, there's, an, there's a whole other like, level of detail which would be wonderful to be able to include. Yeah, but there, there, I mean, there is data out there on that. I'll, I'll show you a, a project in a minute that's got, that uses some data from DEFRA, which is the, the, in the UK, the Agricultural Ministry. They have maps showing the different, um, uh, what do they call it, like land grades across the whole of the UK. And I imagine that's the same for every country in Europe, that they've got sort of land grade mapping you can access. Right, so to go back to So just to prove my point, what I did then was um, use that software to design a food system for myself on the little piece of land which I have in the UK. And that's what it looked like. Um, does it have an overall square meters there? It doesn't, does it? It's about something around... It's something around 4,000 square meters for the, for the whole system, for me. And that was because I chose to include goats in my system. So I wanted to have goat milk and some goat butter. So the, um, the, the grey area and the um, pink area are basically growing the, the f food for the goats. And then I spent uh, about seven years in total actually trying to implement this system on the piece of land that I have in the UK with um, varying degrees of success. So that's uh, growing um, wheat, which is like hand-sown with a little uh, push-along um, uh, seed drill. Uh, planted up um, about a thousand trees to grow this sort of future biofuel crop. Uh -huh. Various experiments growing potatoes on like a larger than just back garden scale and stuff. And that's uh, some grain trials going on. So, um, so then, then the next thing that I did was uh, I had a commission from a, a gallery in Cornwall in the UK to, to um, use this software to model a system for this whole peninsula. This is the Lizard Peninsula in Cornwall in the UK. There's about 9,000 people living there. And so I used the same software to basically design a food system, and this is where the, the um, land-grade maps came in, because in the north of the, the plan up here, um, these lighter areas of land are all like higher grade, so this is where you could grow all the arable, this is where you can grow the wheat and the corn and stuff. This in the middle is moorland, it's like pretty useless for any kind of crop production, so that was grazed with... Um, uh, a heritage variety of cattle, um, and then the these areas which have um, 
which are kind of spotted. They're uh, different areas of forest of different kinds. So that's growing all of the biofuel for the whole population. It turned out that you, this particular area, if there was a sort of an apocalyptic scenario, then this would be a really good place to live in the UK. This is like there's plenty of land here for everybody. And then I did an analysis of all of the um, the produce of every kind. So there's all of the little fishing ports around here because this is a peninsula, so it's got coast all the way around. And there's actually enough. Um, crab and lobster landed on this peninsula to feed the whole population, or keep the whole population in protein requirement anyway. I don't know if you can zoom in on that part up there. Is it possible? Oh, no, sorry, we, maybe not. Oh, yeah. There we go. So there's this, that, that's like how things are broken down. Also did a whole plan to convert the whole peninsula, the whole agricultural production of the peninsula, to be... Um, Horse powered, so there's also uh, factoring in the land that you need to feed the horses. Turns out that the whole food system could operate with 150 head, heavy horses. I think that that's there we go. There's their feed there. That's, that's the horse part. Okay, um, maybe can we zoom back out again? Sorry. Actually, I think I heard a slide with that zoomed in. Anyway, <laughs> there we go. Mm. So, um, yeah. So then, I was like, really, I wanted to think about what exists online to that that could be used to um, sort of upscale this. I started looking around for. Uh, apps which people have been making recently. And here's a really great one. So this is um, created by a, a startup from, you know, based in Belarus. So they set up some machine learning that analyzes satellite imagery from the Copernicus Sentinel satellite. And what we can do is let's get in here. Going to load for us slowly. So this is using, um, I guess it's like using a uh, um, a, a sort of infrared or spectral analysis of re the reflectivity of the crop that existing. You've got they've got three years of data. You can zoo, you can you can track the how each of these fields changes over three years and exactly what crops they're growing. And it's got some analysis here. So this is pretty useful, right? This is in terms of, uh, you can probably actually sort of reverse engineer um, the land grade as well from this, from this data. And it's got um, a great little feature here where you can randomly Mm, well, maybe not. Oh, there we go. Yeah. And this, this, I find this kind of stuff really fascinating because here you can. So where are we? This is Ukraine, and you can see um, the difference here between a, a sort of an older agricultural system and the the remnants of um, or the the effects of collectivization. Really clearly. And then, so they, they actually said that well they did there's three steps to the to the, the machine learning the first one is to sort of like clean the satellite photographs from artifacts that aren't to do with agriculture and the second step is to train an angle algorithm to allocate the field boundaries automatically and then the third step is uh, training another algorithm to determine the crop and they claim an accuracy of 91 uh, percent. It's taking a little bit long to load, but there's, it's, it, if anyone's interested, I, you know, this is, I'll pass the link around. There's some really, really interesting different sort of remnants of different food systems. You can see 
like um, strip farming in Poland and the remains of medieval systems um, and all sorts of stuff. Right, and then oh, one more. I'm going to move on. So um, the next uh, app is this one, which I sent you a link the other day to the right. So on this one, basically, you've got a, a map of the whole of the US, which shows um, where every house is. So you can uh, work out really localized models of um, population density here. So using these two apps, I think you could sort of uh, like roll out my app to to like model any kind of. Um, agriculturally based civilization that you would want. Just pick some random spot and go in. So coupling those two data sets, there's all sorts of possibilities, I think. You can yeah, look at the population distribution on a localized level. Um, and then I think what well, we were talking about earlier on outside very briefly that to make um, uh, to start to design alternative food systems then really um, it's a case of performing network analysis and like working out the um, exactly what resources there are, how far they need to travel. I mean, that's the question, right, about with patchworking, about patchworking agricultural systems, is like the system of exchange and trade and um, how far people need to travel. And is it, is it uh, viable to actually uh, to, to, um, make a localised system compared to a sort of a nationalised or globalised system? So that's a network analysis problem. And then I want to show one more. This is a, an app which is uh, shows, which was kind of like came out of the land rights movement in the UK, and the fact that it's just really really difficult to find pieces of land to buy, and the fact that people um, like plan, planning permission is really hard to get to develop land. Um, it's it's in, in, impossible to set up a patchwork because it's really, really difficult to find out which land is available, and this is a problem, right? Like we were talking about trying to, how to identify pieces of land which aren't already occupied, because everything is occupied. So I think there's some filters here. You can like uh, it shows like a, a land that's owned by the Ministry of Defence and land that's owned by the church, land that's owned by the royal family, and things like this. Quite detailed. So you get these tiny little bits scattered all over the place. But the most, the more interesting section of data is this one. Like, where is the unregistered land? So this is land that's in the UK system. That's the, the, all of the um, the land ownership deeds are held in a central database. And this is showing pieces of land which it's not actually clear who owns. And it's, there's a surprising amount of it, right? And so this isn't land that's not owned by anybody. It's just that the ownership is so old that the, that data isn't into this in the digital system. But within this, there are places that nobody knows who owns and like nobody actually... Um, has any record of of who owns it because maybe it's been passed down um, from generation and gen generation to generation through different families and has never actually been formally sort of um, registered into into the system of deeds and ownership. Well, I've got no idea if anything like this 
operates in Czech Republic. I guess you have the cadastral mapping and things like that. It would be po probably possible to get hold of that data and have access to it. next so so then we've got some like potential ways of like finding bits of land and we've got a way of like working out how much land you need to make a system um, and you've got a way of uh, looking at the, the quality of the land but what would the uh, system the farm a, a patchwork farming system actually look like oh no sorry this is one little e extra part I forgot I put in so this is um, a commission which, using the field machine software, which nearly happened, but didn't quite. It was commissioned by the V&A Museum in London, and then they pulled out, unfortunately. So this would be the sort of the next step of, of uh, my software. Um, so you've got a, a map of Hyde Park here. So the next the, the next development of the software to be, would be to um, write a new piece of software which allowed you to input a vector map. So in this case, I was going to do Hyde Park in London. And then the output from the field machine just basically populates the vector map. So you, again, you could map, the, the idea is that you'd be able to map anywhere in like a high detail. So you could use that other data set from the, um, the, the satellite uh, analysis. And I've just designed this um, analog interface um, to make it into a sort of museum friendly artwork. Um, so yeah, thinking about patchworks that exist within the within agricultural systems themselves. Um, agroecology and polycultures and forest gardening. So forest gardening is a system of, I don't know if any people have come across it, it's like a, a system of agricultural production which is much lower yielding than conventional agriculture but really relies on the um, relationships between plants and how plants exchange with each other to make an agricultural system that has an inherent stability or an inherent um, less of a need for human intervention once it's established. So every plant has a list of needs and offers a list of service, services to other plants, right? So one species of plants, like take an apple tree, will need a certain level of uh, pH in the soil, it will need a certain amount of water, it will need a certain amount of sunlight, it will create a certain amount of shade, um, and it will like take nitrogen, a certain amount of nitrogen from the soil. Other plants will produce nitrogen and put nitrogen into the soil. So the idea with forest gardening is that you make a, a complex network of plants that are going to look after each other and going to sort of like supply each other's needs and fit into the niches very well with, that exist within this sort of complex polyculture system. It's usually perennial. So once you establish a forest garden, it, um, you don't go and plant things there every year. They just come again every year, and it just gets bigger and bigger and more stable. Um, and you have various different uh, effects, like um, one of the, the categories of plant are plants that dynamically accumulate minerals. So some of these plants have got very deep tap roots that actually go down into the decaying rock uh, that's sort of like below the... the the level of the topsoil and actually bring up nutrients from there and like bring it to the surface. When the plant dies off in the winter, those nutrients are then transferred into the top layer of soil where other plants with lower or shorter root systems can actually access them. And agroecology is uh, described as... Um, it basically proposes a context or site-specific manner of... of uh, of studying an agroecological system. As such, it recognises that there is no universal formula or recipe for the su success and maximum well-being of the system. 
Um, thus, agroecology is not defined by certain management principles, such as the use of natural enemies in place of insecticides or polycultures in the place of monocultures. Instead, agroecology basically proposes four system properties of the yeah, four system properties, productivity, stability, sustainability, and equitability, as opposed to disciplines that are concerned only with one or some of these properties, i.e. like conventional agriculture is basically concerned with productivity and nothing else. Um, agroecology sees the four properties interconnected and integral to the success of the whole system. Um, Recognising that these properties are found on a varying spatial scale, agroecologists do not limit themselves to the study of systems at any one scale. Gene, organism, population, community, ecosystem, landscape, biome, field, farm, community, region, state, country, continent. So agroecology studies these four properties through an interdisciplinary lens, using natural sciences to understand elements of agroecology systems such as soil properties, plant-insect interactions, as well as social sciences to understand the effects of farming practice on rural communities, economic constraints to developing new production methods, or cultural factors determining farming practices. So I'm really interested in this like forest gardening thing because of its sort of like in inherent stability, but also because of its low maintenance um, need. And uh, I think that this is really exciting to sort of think about how these systems can be implemented into an urban landscape in the sort of the gaps in between the, um, the concrete jungle, let's say. And so I will now show you a little proposal for... Where's my mouse pointed on? the other window. Yeah, can you cycle through them? There should be another video there somewhere. But. <laughs> it's a bit difficult doing it facing backwards as well. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Oh, there it is. All right. So this is just a little visualization of um, a proposal for us for another software, which would. So basically, if you had a, a database of all of the plant species that you wanted to use in this polyculture matrix, um, in the I've brought a book along with me. I think it's down on the floor there. Um, there's about 5,000 different species which have been proposed to be used in polyculture forest gardening systems, right? And they all have different needs, as I said, and they all, they all provide different services. And these can be um, broken down into different parameters, so like um, pH requirement, sunlight requirement, shade creation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if, the, um, if you had a database of all of these parameters, and then had a site which you would, could then um, make an analysis of in terms of what exists there, soil pH, the rainfall, um, the, the shade mapping cast by buildings, etc. Then um, presumably you could like, write an algorithm that, or train an algorithm that would then be able to design um, a complete matrix, like a self sustaining, self-supporting, low-maintenance matrix of plants. And then um, uh, it would, like, the, the, um, the software would basically make a design that's specific to the, exactly the location that you're, like, trying to implement this in. So um, this is something that would really, really, I think, really interest uh, city authorities because... 
cities in Europe, at least, and um, have this like um, a, a, have a, a list of boxes that they need to tick about social inclusion, about greening the city, about like um, providing food inside the city, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and the reason why people don't, the cities don't implement this kind of forest gardening is because it's too complex to design. Like, there aren't enough experts that know how to create these systems. Um, and once you've actually designed a system, there aren't enough, there, there's no way of managing the system in a sort of like a, a joined up way. So the, the proposed software would design um, a forest garden system for any location, and then it would um, be able to sort of like implement the management of that system as well. So each plant would have its list of parameters, each plant would have its list of needs, um, it would have a schedule of when things need to be watered, which could be then um, uh, uh, updated with like real-time, real-world data on climate and rainfall, and it have various different sensors, etc. So sort of like feed back data back into the system, um, and then each plant, each crop would have um, like harvest times, pruning times, and stuff like this. And you see how it's like working on this different layered system, like there's an understory there that's got a different requirement than the upper story, things like that. Sorry, all this zooming in and out is a bit superfluous, but this is like a, I was just trying to make, put together a promotional video for like trying to get some, some kind of like seed funding for this project. The next important part, once you've designed a system and you've, you've worked out how it's going to, um, all the plants are going to interact with each other, um, then you get the question of um, management and social interaction from the community. So I had some very interesting conversations last summer with a, a behavioural psychologist uh, about the reasons why most, so many communities and so many sort of like um, community-led gardening systems or gardening projects fail because people aren't all the same. If you've got a, a, a community garden and you've got a whole bunch of people trying to look after it, then um, some people are going to want to work in a group. Some people want to work on their own. Members of the group like, will hate other members of the group. Some people will feel an affinity to one plant. Some people will feel an affinity to a part of the system or the, whole, or the overall system and all of these different sort of factors, which are basically um, sort of behavioural psychology um, effects or, or concerns, right? So then the next level would be to uh, train an algorithm to like understand that, specific to the group of people who's going to interact with this garden. And then the software would then assign the tasks that need to happen to the people who are most relevant to that task or like would like enjoy that task the most. So um, it would like basically give a sort of social media shout out to like whoever is in the area that likes digging potatoes when the potatoes need to be dug, and if that person's not available, then it would go down the list for the next available person, etc. So this is like my imagining of how um, a, how a software system or a, an artificial intelligence could actually um, uh, like close the management gap. In, in um, yeah, I don't know if I have I have a lot of experience of travelling around different communities in Europe and looking at intentional communities and different sort of like small scale farming projects and stuff and they, it's just so much arguing and there's so many bosses you know so many people who want to be in charge who don't actually have the knowledge to do that so my proposal is like you just scrub out all of that ego problem by giving that job to the AI but then. You know, there's this, um, this uh, let's say, people who are interested in community gardening and, like, low-carbon farming, and you can say that they're not naturally, don't have a natural um, affinity to the digital, right? And then people who know a lot about the digital and are happy to be working with code and inventing um, uh, digital systems don't necessarily or don't naturally automatically know a great deal about horticulture or agriculture. So there's this kind of, like this chasm between the two. 
which I think would be really interesting to look at closing. Um, and then, uh, okay. Full screen up there. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, polycultures and um, this kind of like granular scale, granular, like high granularity scale agricultural systems have this problem of labour, because um, if you're making polycultures and complex systems, um, they they're not very uh, they don't work very well with like automation and ro and people are trying to sort of come up with robotics and stuff to deal with this but but really um, rather than sort of propose this for these forms of agriculture and then propose ways of um, actually implementing the labor element through robotics I think it's probably more interesting and more important and more valid to actually propose a revalorization of that portion of human labor that could be devoted to the creation of sustenance for those humans. So the revaloration of, of agricultural labor. Um, uh, but this is like really tricky subject. Nobody in, in generally wants to do farming. Farming is seen as like a really low class operation or low class oc occupation, let's say. Um, so some work that I've been trying to do is, uh, is addressing that. Uh, yeah, the other, the other video, if possible. Where it's gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a funny little thing I made. Um, this is called the breast plower metric, and it's a replica of a medieval farming tool. Um, the original in the museum made a replica of it. And um, basically it's like the poor man's plough, like a medieval tool for, for turning the soil, for growing cereal crops, that um, for somebody who can't afford an ox or a horse. Uh, and what I wanted to do was actually find out how efficient was this. And in doing so, like answer the question... Like, what is the base coefficient of human labor? Like, labor completely um, separated from techniques. Just like, what can I do with my body? How many calories do I need to burn in order to procure how many calories? Like, and also, how many minutes does it take to grow a num the amount of calories that I need to survive for X number of minutes? Because these are, like, seem to me like very, very basic questions that um, no one is actually able to answer. Because we did this kind of like hand farming and hand labor and had a higher, a higher value on agricultural labor. When we had that higher value on agricultural labor, nobody needed to write these things down or analyze them. It's only since techniques and since industrial agriculture that we start to sort of map out the so-called efficiencies of agricultural systems in terms of labor. So you can't actually make any kind of comparison. I think this is really interesting and really important to do. Um, I'm not quite sure how this relates to the theme of patchworks, but I think it's, it's part of has to be part of the argument, right, for small scale, is to understand exactly, um, like how how would a, an agricultural system decoupled from techniques and decoupled from a fossil fuel economy actually function in terms of how many hours do I need to spend doing that to stay alive, and then you can begin to sort of like postulate about how that might intermesh with ideas like universal basic income. Um, and if the AI is like looking after it or uh, has, has automated everything else or is taking care of all other forms of production, then maybe we could all just go and spend more time in the garden. And maybe that wouldn't be such a bad thing if we actually could convince, the, we had the arguments to show um, how long that would actually take, how much of that time it would take. Um, and just as one little aside, um, yeah, I need to get rid of this. <laughs> uh, 
I wanted to, just to finish off, do a little um, myth bust on vertical farming. I think it's gone backwards, so I have to go to the beginning. There we go. So vertical farming, which is like, um, yeah, part of the sort of like techno-optimist lobby in the agricultural sector, right? Um, so, photovoltaics, solar panels, allegedly can produce 10 times more energy per square meter than plants. But solar panels don't grow and they don't replicate themselves. Photovoltaics have to be made somewhere. The materials have to be mined, processed, fabricated, shipped, installed. And then if all you're doing with that energy you've expended is like, uh, and the infrastructure that you're making is to produce energy to turn into light, to grow plants, then why bother exactly? Vertical farming is really good at making wild claims, or the vertical farm lobby is really good at making wild claims, such as vertical farming can feed the world. As you see, there's all over the internet, like this is the future, we're going to feed the world with vertical farming. Vertical farming has the possibility to feed the world, but seriously, right, in order that we would do that, if we converted the whole of the world's agricultural system to a vertical farming system, um, we, would, we would have to... Uh, we would have to use a, an area equivalent, if at a 10% efficiency, we would use an area equivalent to, to 10, uh, sorry, 10 times efficiency of that um, solar energy-like production. We would, we would be using an area of land equivalent to 10% of the land in, in current agricultural production. So this is one of the claims of the, the vertical farming, that it's 10 times more productive in terms of space used. It's true. But verticality requires material infrastructure. So if 30, at the moment, 37% of the planet's land surface is in agricultural production. 11% of the, the Earth's surface is used to raise arable crops. So even if we said the whole population of the Earth converted to, vegan, uh, to a vegan diet, the best sort of like a rule of thumb scenario we could say that we would need 15% of the, the planet's land surface for agriculture. So at an efficiency of 10 times, which is the claim from the vertical farms, right, this means that we would need 1.5% of the planet's land surface area and stack it into a vertical arrangement. So for scale, let's think that the Earth's land surface is 510 million square kilometres, Europe's land surface area is 10.1 million square kilometres, roughly 2% of the planet's land surface area. So that means stacking 75% of Europe into a vertical arrangement. Like, that's like an infrastructure project beyond like, any possibility. The other claim it says is like, you know, one, one other claim is like it uses no soil. Like, uses no soil, great. Uses no soil. What does it use? Where do the nutrients come from? If they're not actually coming from the living soil itself, then it means they're being mined or synthesized somewhere. And this would obviously have to take place on a much larger scale than in conventional agriculture, which does actually manage to procure some of, its, some of the plant nutrition from the soil itself. Uh, another claim is like 95% uh, less water. Less water. There's 95% less water than what? Maybe compared to an industrial greenhouse uh, on the south coast of Spain or in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights, but not compared to the majority of cereal production, for example, in the whole of Europe, because cereal production in Europe uses no more rain than fall, falls on the surface naturally, no more water than falls on the surface naturally in the form of rain, right? So, um, yeah, vertical farming isn't an option. Uh, I don't think at all, and um, it's like a problem of, um, uh, I don't know, it's like, hor I don't, th I think that in the case of agriculture, horizontality is not a bad thing, let's say that. 
Um, yeah, I think I'll finish on that. So, that, yeah, I mean, that's what I wanted to do, really, is to show it's a few projects and show a few um, online web resources. And then maybe, um, I know you don't want to have questions now, but uh, maybe there'll be an opportunity later on to, like, sort of brainstorm some of that and come up with some other questions. Great. I don't know if I have a volume here. I think I'm going to go back next time I farm. I'm going to put that Fitbit on my left leg yes. and make sure I'm rotated to properly. Uh, next up will be Louis. And, uh, he'll jump in. We'll hold questions to the next uh, within okay. a gap. We're a little over time right now. Yeah, we can uh, jump with uh, maybe one or two before Louis starts. Any questions? More of a suggestion that we checked out the upsell of intelligence because this is a EU project that's also just began last year. We're undergoing it, so making a database uh, that has uh, that basically provides um, information concerning yeah, the soil, uh, like what you were showing uh, in terms of soil variability, and also crop yield, and also just a whole seed bank of where. I guess it's at this moment it's receiving EU funding and there's an open source uh, application that's looking to expand. So it might be actually another uh, consideration. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to repeat that real fast. There's a question about if uh, Paul Cheney has uh, encountered Kepsilla. Kepsilla, yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Well, we should, we should like, have a session just done. Okay. Um, All right, well, thank you uh, for inviting me. And I'm very happy, actually, to be following Paul because what I'm going to be presenting is really rather theoretical, but it does uh, depart in a situation of micromanaged and the like. Uh, hence the play on words, I suppose, in the title, which is Dispatches from the Event Horizon and thinking through the idea of the patch uh, and the dis patch, perhaps. All right, so I'm, uh, I'm just going to launch straight into this. I don't have any visuals apart from the one dystopian image up there, but there are some great images over there. So beguiled by the idea that a multiple scenario universe means alternative realities that can simply be tuned into or out of as a matter of convenience or as a solution to whatever local or global crisis they choose to evoke, the mutant children of Buckminster Fuller and Ayn Rand have in turn bequeathed social and ecological practices deeply at variance with their progressivist and emancipatory claims. In this uncanny region between Spaceship Earth and Atlas Shrugged, there is no such thing as immaterial labor Every action is aggregated into the production of the real, whether curated or elective, secret or flagrantly commodified. In so doing, the inherently adversarial structure of this collectivity of fractured viewpoints is made to, ac made to accord with a principle of dynamic maximization, what the poet William Blake phrased as enough or too much. The question we're confronted with here is, how is it possible to anticipate that ideal mode of operation, that advantageous balance between contending forces of a world system contiguous with the so-called dominion of man? From the epic of Gilgamesh to the Greek city-state to Malthus to our contemporary cybersphere, the concept of a natural homeostatic order has evolved technologically into entirely unforeseen formulations. Where the eridogenesis 
evokes the prototypical great flood as corrective to human excess, the city-state evokes a techne politique, uh, in that case col colonization, while Malthusianism conjures inbuilt eugenic mechanisms in the balance between population and productivity. It's sobering to consider that when Aristotle sought to define sustainable population growth in the politics, the size of the average Greek city-state was three to 4,000 inhabitants, with Athens and Sparta representing the exception at approximately 10,000. Uh, by the advent of the Industrial Revolution, the city-state was obviously no longer the political unit on which growth was factored, yet mercantilism and the emerging predominance of corporate entities in political and economic life in Britain and elsewhere would nevertheless continue to draw on the city-state as a model for human resource management. In the early 1800s, one of the so-called fathers of British socialism, Robert Owen, proposed a reorganization of the state on the principle of the semi-autonomous industrial polis, for which the Scottish mill town of New Lanark, which Owen managed, and which, incidentally, um, Jeremy Bentham was the investor in, uh, was to serve as the paradigm. New Lanark housed a permanent workforce of approximately 1,200, and Owen envisaged a national grid of some 400 similar entities interspersed by agricultural zones, uh, apparently supporting a UK population at the time of some five and a half million. By simple multiplication, this would today represent an industrial polis of merely 14,000 against a current UK population of 66 million. A simple comparison of this kind exposes the need not only to factor in those economies of scale consistent with two and a half centuries of urban industrialization, it also raises questions about the political sustainability of a social economic system driven by an undisguised tendency towards obsolescence. With increased efficiency in core production through automation, matched to a <coughs> inflationary growth of consumption, there nevertheless occurs a significant contraction in the industrial labor force against a rapid expansion of the general population. And here arises the basic paradox of any constructed mercantile system exposed to increasingly global economic pressures, what Moldbug calls patchwork, a global spider web of tens, even hundreds of thousands of sovereign independent mini countries, each governed by its own joint stock corporation. That's his definition. It isn't simply a question of whether such a system is technically viable or even desirable. Once the social problem of human obsolescence is addressed, for example, by broad-based uh, consumer credit, service industries, and so on. The real question is, if cybernetics, through analogous distributed systems of control and communication, radically evolves the mechanisms of population growth as conceived by Aristotle, uh, thus producing what on the face of it appears to be the conditions for widespread emancipation from onerous labor, does it provide a political idea of what this growth is for? If cybernetics appears to re-engineer the limits of collective human action by altering the ratios of environmental self-sustainability, this movement is nevertheless compensated for by the seemingly irrational tendency of free market capitalism to generate ever-increasing amounts of waste. The incongruity between efficiency and profit incentive has grown to such dimensions as to, to define an entire globally evolved system of entropy, one which threatens uh, an imminent homeostatic readjustment on a planetary scale, <laughs> while in a monstrous iteration of the commodity fetish, increasingly assuming the characteristics of an autonomous agency. That is to say, like the approaching technological singularity, uh, its evolution appears symbiotic with, the global system of entropy more and more assumes the character of a phenomenon independent of human control. This cybernetic doppelganger has not only become detached from any techne politique capable of halting, let alone regulating its successes, but appears driven by an inherent catastrophism. This, at least, may uh, be described as the con uh, sorry. <clears throat> this, at least, might be described as the conservationist viewpoint, alarmed, if not by the environmental consequences, at least by those for the maintenance of a liberal humanist status quo, from a broadly accelerationist perspective, this movement is that of a globally transformative, even revolutionary force heralding the society to come. 
In anticipation of the latter, numerous templates have been proposed from Moldbug's joint stock patchwork feudalism to open source eco-social platforming to distributed crypto-cybernetic systems of non-government to full luxury communism. The price appears modest, the sixth mass extinction, the end of life as we know it, the end of the world even, or simply the end of humanity, and who knows, the beginning of a next evolutionary phase. What does not appear in this prognosis is the end of the corporate state apparatus. Politically, the cybernetic revolution left no alternatives on the table. What we call the global order is a full-spectrum capitalist technocracy whose market harmonization belies a system of exploitative and grossly unequal social and environmental relations, disguised behind such false dichotomies as democracy and totalitarianism, the dichotomies that have uh, more in common than their ruling classes have in common with the mass of their populations, or then, they, or then their consumptive social systems have with the environment's capacity to support them. Such naked irreconcilables have in turn contributed to a return to political resistance on the margins of the permitted, from the black bloc and the cyber guerrilla column to populist anti-movements like Extinction Rebellion and the Gilets Jaunes. Uh, yet by their representation or non-representation in the political imaginary, such forms of resistance are always made to entail a paradox, as simultaneously a desire to subvert the corporate state while resurrecting the benevolent welfare state. On the one hand, an abolition or an opting out. On the other, a reconstitution. Subversion, in any case, is always an operation from within. Now, the extent of this paradox can be gauged by examining the logistical obstacles that the cybernetic revolution has placed in the path of autonomous political action. Take, for example, Britain's largest sustained experiment in alternative living, the e-pile, the Eel Pie Island Commune, located in the Thames at Twickenham in London, which dates from the 1960s, current population 100, only marginally less than the 130 recorded at the community's height. By comparison, Freetown Christiania in Copenhagen sustains a resident population of 900. Consider both of these in relation to that paradigm of vertically integrated, globally decented neoliberalism, Amazon, whose UK workforce distributed around the country in a series of logistical hubs redolent of Owen's semi-autonomous microstates, currently totals just uh, 27,500 in an industry which in 2017 alone accounted for 586 billion of GDP and spans the data sets of a global demographic numbering also in the billions. According to conventional manufacturing statistics, meanwhile, the UK is presently ranked eighth largest globally by output, while new technology and smart factories mean that this output corresponds to a domestic workforce of only two and a half million against national unemployment figures of one and a half million. None of these structures, communal, corporate, statist, is self-sufficient. Their autonomy consists solely and somewhat paradoxically in comprising integral units in what amounts to a multi-dimensional global patchwork. It's no surprise either that the island of Britain produces only 50% of the foodstuffs it annually consumes, purchased at the expense of its strategic advantage in manufacture while a £40 billion uh, pound deficit means its economy will never, of its own accord, be in balance. These figures, of course, offer no real augury of coming events when arrayed before the spectre of the Anthropocene, against whose imminent derangements of the world order neither fiscal policy nor technological solutions appear likely mit mitigation strategies, neither for the corporate state apparatus, the ecosystem at large, nor the mass of humanity. Given that the scenario is one of no exit, the outcomes are more likely to be infrastructural collapse, resource wars, mass eugenics, famine, epidemic, and other apocalyptic niceties, rather than any proactive conversion of the corporate state to debt reduction, environmental responsibility, and sustainable communitarianism, were such a thing in fact even possible with populations reaching 500 million in the UK, in the EU, sorry, 325 million in the United States, 260 million in Indonesia, 200 million in Brazil, uh, etc. Not to mention the 130 billion in India and the 1.3 uh, 
sorry, the 1.3 billion in India and the 1.4 billion in China, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The political task posed by the Anthropocene can too easily be obfuscated by sheer statistics, magnifying the convulsions of that great anonymous, as Victor Hugo wrote, which is always found in human crises and in social births. If such a debilitating movement presents itself on the one hand as a fait accompli, it simultaneously evokes on the other precisely those statistical complexities solely accessible to cybernetic understanding. We can see how such a situation might appear emancipative uh, within the frame of reference of a humanist project that imagines it has succeeded in transcending its worldly conditions by means of pure techno. But in speaking this way, can we even know, first of all, what the Anthropocene is? If we accede to the idea that the Anthropocene defines a geological epoch, materially inscribed as a historical accumulation, less of human actions per se than of technology as defined uh, by uh, the history of industrialization, we make it appear as if the agent of the present crisis, or rather the crisis of the present, isn't the ideological system that produced it, but some calamitous non-human agency that can only be appeased if not brought under the yoke. In short, a Goethe Demerum, marking the great revolutionary event of our time, in which we must either succeed in overthrowing the planetary gods or sacrifice ourselves to them, whether it be the revolt, whether it be uh, in revolt against the world or against capitalism. Like all false choices, these too are ideologically inscribed, here masking the movement of capital as both technological transcendence of this world and as the promise of the one to come. Put otherwise, in the contest between neoliberalism and its discontents, capitalism has effectively come to designate both the concrete form of this crisis and its only possible negation. The return of the geologic real, called the Anthropocene, is presented as nothing but capitalism's, uh, capital's reification as planetary agency, inscribing a global destiny as inexorable as plate tectonics. This is neoliberalism's fait accompli. The problem of the Anthropocene, so conceived, is thus the problem of the fait accompli as such. Here, the logic capture of the world in all its alternative scenarios. In this, it approximates a singularity, the singularity of history, we might say, or as Hegel and Marx ventriloquized by Fukuyama might say, the end of history. Jena in, in 1807, Paris in 1848, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, were all doubtless premature signals, though the point is surely moot, since in positing itself as such an end, this fait accompli always arrives before its time and will be the last thing anyone will ever remember. It marks the return of the proverbial repressed from beyond the event horizon, the uncanny doppelganger of a universal anachronism, time out of joint. This anachronism, like that endlessly extruded present of post-ideology that neoliberalism still pretends to be, inhabits our worldview like a vertically integrated crisis balanced on the tip of a needle. The tipping point is right there in a future that doesn't exist, that already happened, that must be deferred at any cost. Beyond lies the unpresentable, the impossible, that most ideal of all possible worlds to which the word future corresponds solely to the extent that it represents an end to the spectral existence of history and an end to a certain political possibility of history. This neo-evangelist mesmerism by ultimate ends goes beyond mere Hegelian theory and bewitches the teleology of power itself, which henceforth perceives its hegemony as not simply destined, as that which must necessarily befall every possible present to come, as though it were an emissary of this future or this non-future itself, but as the very manifestation of non-futurity, its essential being, so to speak, and not simply its signifier. In the final instance, however, this most extraordinary fait accompli, the singularity of the world refracted through the manifestation and transcendence of its own end, reveals itself as nothing other than the spectacle of power or history converging with its ideal image, technicity. In this cosmic microdrama, the supervening spectre of capital as both production of phantasms and phantasmatic mode of production returns not in place of the real, its transcendental signified, but as the production of the real as such. Yet its anachrony means that this movement of totalization describes a feedback loop, 
an interminable circuit of sign substitutions in which the return of the real is suspended like a premonition, the premonition of the as such. Call it metaphor of metaphor, irreducible along the vector of its algorithmic freefall, event horizon, black hole metaphysics, history and world, sign and concept, all convergent in this ideal because unpresentable anachronism of which capital nevertheless produces an image. Just as in its desire to inhabit the as such, we might begin to imagine that capital itself produces this very irre irreducibility as both sameness within self-difference and sameness as the non-identical, and that it is the persistence of this irreducibility, in spite of the appearance of an insistent dialecticism, that causes it to assume the form of a return in the real. Let us suppose that, that it is this irreducibility that signifies in the Anthropocene as that which fails to accomplish itself, here as capital's totalizing movement. The return of the real as fait accompli thus acquires the form of a return of the impossible, capital's impossible ideality reified as the future impossibility of the world, so that we might say that in the Anthropocene, capital returns in its pure form. In this sense, both the impossible and the end of capitalism consist not, as Zizek suggests, in a conceptual failure to, to imagine a world without capitalism, but the contrary, in capital's own failure to ideally produce itself, the dream of communism. What appears in this formulation to be somehow revelatory is that the very logic of capital is vested in its fundamental incommensurability, not as dysfunction, but as dynamic interval source of every operation of power, of value, of information, which is desire to internalize by paradoxically reifying under the sign of an absolute self-sufficiency, causes to resemble the insuperable alienation of the Freudian ego ideal, an alienation which in the Grundrisse uh, Marx correctly surmises to be the constitutive condition of the so-called individual. Its movement, in other words, isn't something that happens to a transcendental subject, it produces a subject. This is why we must guard ourselves against the kind of thinking that would reduce the problem of the Anthropocene and of capital in general to one of concrete situations versus mere abstractions. In producing a subject alongside the representation of an ego ideal, the logic of capital disseminates itself in a broadly isomorphic movement that gives rise to what we might call, somewhat paradoxically, the consciousness of the real. This consciousness is nothing other than ideology itself. Not one ideology or another, capitalism, socialism, communism, etc., or any privileged ideology above all others, in the presumptive form of an ideology of ideology, for example, Judeo-Christian Islam, but the very possibility of a system of signification, or what we should be unafraid of calling uh, meaning. It disseminates itself in this way because at root, capital is ambivalent with regard to supposed ideological content, is concerned solely with the leveraging of value, and its structures have evolved accordingly and in such complex multiplicity that they can only be described as universal. It's this universality that must somehow be reconciled with the perception of capital as monolithic, a vision of globalization fixated upon an image of one world, the convergence of all possibility upon a singular end. And if this convergence only appears to be mediated by the so-called Anthropocene, this is because the consciousness of the real to which the logic of capital gives rise is not the reflection of an ego ideal. To this anthropo anthropomorphism too, it remains fundamentally ambivalent, since it itself is not a reflection, but a generalized reflection effect. There is virtually nothing uh, which separates this consciousness from technicity. What then is this Anthropocene in which consciousness of the real manifests as global technicity? Quantum research has arrived at a somewhat belated supposition that reality is information, which it qualifies by adding that information is in turn produced by consciousness. That is to say, by some form of observational event, some mechanism or valency productive of a determinate state from a superposition of possibilities. If we ask, what is the state of the world, it appears we are posing both a theoretical question and a question about the Earth's material condition. One might appear political, the other geological or even cosmological, yet both are addressed, first of all, to their own descriptive systems, and the world to which these systems correspond is both codependent and ideological. Not in the constructed sense of a mass hallucination, 
nor in the purely doctrinal sense of a worldview or even an epistemology. If ideology is the consciousness of the real, it is so in a manner that is profoundly uncanny with regard to conventional notions of what reality is. This is because the symbolic order to which consciousness corresponds is emergent and not determined by what we imagine a rational causality to be. Ought we to, ought we to posit the Anthropocene, therefore, as the negative consciousness of a non-future that represents its own failed transcendence, a consciousness that doesn't correspond either to an objective correlative of human agency or any type of emancipation from capitalist subjectivity, but rather its definitive inscription as the thought of the impossible. What would the subject of such a thought be? If the limits of the world are the limits of ideology, then there is nothing abstract about ideological operations. Yet by the same token, the work of abstraction defines the real. When we ask what is the state of the world, we are firstly asking about the state of the descriptive system in which our frame of reference is situated. In other words, we are asking about the relation of subjectivity to consciousness. It isn't that ideology thereby projects itself as some kind of subjectivism onto the world, but rather this world, as the non-correlation of subject and consciousness, describes a mobile, mobile semiosphere, a poiesis, whose holographic surface of sense may be said to affect what is being called global weirding. This weeding can be considered as indeed a patchwork of discrete valences, producing a composite image of reality that remains uncanny with regard to itself. It is, in other words, the event horizon of all information pertaining to a world that does not appear as the world. A world, as Wittgenstein says, that is everything that is the case, not only as it, as it is perceived, but as it consists in its possibility. Global weirding isn't a glitch in the world. It is the mode of operation of a world that has become impossible. What is glitched is rather the relationship between the way these operations signify and the ideological character of the descriptive systems applied to them. Since the world, in either its possibility or impossibility, is emergent and not some transcendental entity. One of the discon disconcerting features of ideology is that rather than describe a delirium, as Deleuze and Guattari suppose, describes instead the constitutive condition of any descriptive system. What Lacan calls the symbolic order is contiguous with that fundamental fantasy of experience which in Freud allies with reason itself. Consequently, an unwelcome thesis proposes itself here, that in place of the bleaky and eternal contraries, the irreconcilable antagonisms of class consciousness uh, or class conflict, the dialectical supersessions of history and technology, there is, in fact, only a smeared-out topology of superpositions, possible worlds, so-called, brought into being or abolished under the critical mass of consciousness, fundamentally irreconcilable to anything more real, more totalizable than their own status as information. When we speak of the world, then, we are speaking of a global patchwork of delocalized subsystems in which other worlds are ending all the time. But is that enough to affect a politics beyond vague appeals to terms like salvage, sustainability, survival, and supersession? By themselves, such patchworks do not perform a demystification of the ideological construction of the global any more than a pixelated universe represents a disillusionment of smooth space. Patchwork, like pixelation, makes the perception of smoothness possible. It does so by defining a minimal a minimum interval or minimum difference from which the fabric of the world is thereby comprised, just as alienated subjectivity constitutes the minimum political unit, not because it is any way more fundamental, for example, than the commodity, but because the very logic and structure of commodification originates in it, just as the very logic and structure of the social originates in it. That both of these possibilities occur simultaneously goes some way towards accounting for the inherent weirdness of the political, a weirdness that permits classic market capitalism to give rise not only to global neoliberalism, but also to the thought of its transcendental recapitulation as world socialism. This is not the same thing, however, as the concerted effects of weirding produced by such ideological antagonism. Such weirdness nowhere permeates contemporary political discourse more than on the question of the Anthropocene, in which the movement of history, as Marx notoriously conceived, has moved beyond the tragic and farcical 
into the domain of the sublime, a sublimity encapsulated in the title of a recent book uh, on the critique of globalization, Un autre fond du monde est possible, another end of the world is possible, a quasi-situationist détournement of those optimistic 1968 slogans about alternative futures without capitalism. This isn't quite the same thing as Mackenzie Walk's uh, reflection vis-a-vis -vis Rosa Luxemburg that it used to be socialism or barbarism, now it's barbarism or barbarism. In one form or another, the end of the world has always served as a teleolog teleological reference point. Barbarism a la mode, let's say. But if the recurrence of this trope in the present owes a specific historical debt to a European civilizing project, this is mostly due to the very considerable resources that that project directed towards constructing an idea of one world, a world in which, to paraphrase Hegel, it would be able to see itself everywhere and always reflected. An image of the, dis of the sublime, destined, like so much romantic poetry, to be sabotaged by its own worst metaphor, that pathetic fallacy of transcendent man. Disconcerted with what it saw, the project of European civilization became desirous of alternative worlds, alternative civilizations, alternative natures, all to its own specifications, of course. And if the entire project of Western humanism can thus be regarded as an education in rational barbarism, wresting the end of the world from the grip of irrational <coughs> gods by compulsory mass industrialization, etc., then there is nothing at all uncanny about the present world crisis. Indeed, it is the business of humanism uh, to endow every crisis of its own making with a productivist materialist vector, thereby providing the occasion for its next magical act of transcend, uh, transcendence. Call it the eternal return of the post-human. As Lautremont might have said, the end of the world is necessary. Progress implies it. I'm going to end on that. Check out. Wow. Okay. Great. Um, we're still going to hold questions uh, for the end there. Um, following after this will actually be Seb uh, presenting his part, but uh, we got about 15 minutes, so no worries on that. Um, we're going to take a 15-minute break now, um, and if you have any questions, reach out to any of us throughout. Thank you.
Prdelka, prdelka, prdelka. What about, what about this one? Yay. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, we'll, so be we'll be talking about, about psychospiritual, spiritual, spiritual phase of collapse. Of collapse. 
and, and uh, uh, specifically, specifically about, about the deep, deep adaptation, adaptation agenda, agenda uh, offered, offered by John, by John Mendel. Mendel. Uh, which, uh, which I think is a great, great first, first step for us, for us at this moment. moment. If we want, if we to, want talk to talk about, about uh, think about, think about uh, patch reality, 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 reality and, and uh, stuff, like, stuff that. like that. So, so in my, in my first, first uh, uh, patch patch work work workshop, workshop talk, talk, I've introduced, I've introduced the, the idea, idea of, of topophilia. 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 Uh, which, uh, is which is the love, the love of, space of space as the, as key, the component, key component uh, for uh, when, when you want, you want to start, start uh, cultivating, cultivating a piece of reality, reality as your own. own. And I think, and I think this, this uh, concept, concept should stay in your mind, mind while, 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 while you listen to this, to this uh, talk, talk, because, because so we're going to face, face the darker, darker side, side, side of patchwork work and why it's needed. It's needed. And I think, and I think we'll, we'll uh, get into uh, places, places that are very far from loving a place. So... Um, I, had I had to start, to start from, from uh, some, point, some point, and uh, I, think I think there's, there's uh, some, some somewhat, somewhat uh, of an accepted, accepted role for, for the generational, generational theory by, by Strauss and Ho, which, which says, says that, that uh, we have we cultural, cultural generations that are defined, defined by specific moments, moments that create some, some imprint, imprint on them, on them and, and uh, create, create a generation, generation that has some goal or something, or something to do while, while they're a part, part of our culture. And, and uh, uh, from this from analysis, analysis uh, I would, I would like like to uh, say that, say that uh, I think I Generation Y, uh, the millennials, millennials, have, have two, strategic two strategic goals ahead of them. Of them. So, so now, now we'll, we'll be talking, talking about, about the first, first one, one which, which I think, I think is, very is very important, important because it's a psychospiritual spiritual or socio-emotional socio apparatus, apparatus that needs, that needs to, be to be developed so we can, so we can start, start thinking and feeling, and feeling the bottlenecks that we're, that we're approaching. Uh, uh, and this and is, this of, is course of course, a very, very wide uh, topic. topic. And, and uh, uh, some, some people say that, say that we've already, already uh, went, uh, went, we already went through one collapse, which was like the collapse of the human as an active part of the world and so on. So, so now we're, now we're facing, facing more, more of these, these bottlenecks, bottlenecks, more, more of, more of these, these uh, crises, crises and collapses, and collapses of, all of all kinds. And I think, and I the, think second the second uh, thing we'll, we'll have to do uh, before, before we phase out of existence, existence as a generation, as a generation uh, is, uh, is to uh, engage, engage in, in civic, civic war. war. Uh, which uh, means which getting, getting involved, involved with institutions, with institutions and bureaucracies at a whole, whole different, different uh, level, level with much, with much more organization. So on. But, but I won't, I won't be addressing this one because it's much harder, harder for me to talk, talk about, it about it since I'm since already, already involved, involved with the psychological debate. debate. So, so some, some important, important, important concepts, concepts uh, before, before we start. We start. <coughs> So, I, so think I think the, the first, first important, important concept, concept uh, at the moment, moment is, is the ongoing, ongoing uh, so-called so game, game over, over debate, debate between, between scientists, scientists and journalists. Because if, because you're, if you're an honest scientist, scientist and, and an honest journalist, journalist, journalist and you start, start talking, talking to each other, to each other you, have you have to uh, conclude that, that uh, there's, there's something, something really weird happening, happening uh, uh, that won't be won't nice in the future. future. And then and there's, there's a debate about how much we can call that a game game over for civilization, we know it. And, and uh, there, are there are a lot, like a lot of scientists, scientists and journalists, journalists that talk about this and they, they, have, they have different arguments and we'll get, we'll get that later. later. Just, just remember that the, the game over, over debate is basically, is basically the debate, debate uh, about, about how, how much we should show people, people how, how much we should uh, publish, publish research, research uh, and, so and so on. Then there's, then there's the, the present, present dilemma, dilemma of quality of life, of life in the future. In the future. Because, <laughs> because, because if, if uh, only some, some, some of us, some of us part, part of the population, population starts, starts working, working towards, towards solving, solving the situation, or, or maybe, maybe investing, investing in some, in some uh, technologies and stuff that could, that could actually, actually help us, uh, and, uh, and the larger, larger part of humanity, of humanity will just, just continue, continue with the old fossil fuel stuff, stuff uh, and so on. So on. It's not going to be an optimal result either way. So I think applying this dilemma to groups of people at the moment, investing in various pro projects uh, is very important. Um, then, because we're talking about uh, a deep adaptation agenda, I think it would, it's uh, important to understand what people, people mean, mean when, when they, they say, say deep. deep. And I would uh, you know, contrast this to the debate between soft and hard science. So the humanities and uh, psychology and so on are usually uh, call, called soft science, uh, and natural science and physics and so on is usually en engineering and STEM stuff is usually called hard science. So we can also uh, detect some um, another axis in this, and that would be uh, basically shallow and deep. Like when we do something uh, in a shallow way, it's uh, usually uh, di dictated by uh, the quantity. Uh, by the amount of people reached and by the impact overall. And it's usually aimed at the lowest common den denominator in each debate where this uh, strategy is applied. Uh, 
And opposed to that is the deep strategy, which is about uh, finding values that are, you know, uh, extremely subjective, but uh, rooted in the reality as, as it is, whatever it is. I think this, this, this uh, deep values mean st uh, the, the stuff that keeps people going even in extreme situations. And I think that's why uh, deep adaptation is such an important topic even to word patchwork. And that's why my, it's my second step uh, in my approach to words patchwork. <coughs> patchwork already can be considered uh, as uh, an effect of, uh, or patchworking can be considered as the effect of the post-sustainability fragmentation we're seeing happening already. And I think uh, the debates here in uh, the north and the west of the uh, planet usually uh, completely miss the point uh, about how much suffering is already happening to the south. And uh, we usually also focus on a very specific strata of society and we don't talk about the suffering of uh, certain classes of uh, people even uh, today in our uh, societies. So I think uh, patchworking is already an attempt by uh, a certain piece of society, part of society, to actually get involved with places and find out how you can calculate, uh, as we've seen from Paul Cheney's debate, uh, how to actually make it healthy and productive and to create a thriving human community and connection to a piece of land. And uh, of course, when we've, we were talking about soft science and hard science, we can also talk about soft power and hard power. Okay, so uh, hard power is the uh, old question, how many divisions does a certain country have or certain leader have for a conflict, uh, which is usually a question of economics and uh, a question of uh, conventional warfare. And then we have uh, soft war, which is basically uh, a type of cultural uh, colonization, or it can be a way to assert, assert yourself culturally in a society and actually uh, be a healthy part of it. So, you know, you can, you can actually talk about uh, this uh, agonism uh, aspect to war, that it's a process that uh, if, if actual violence isn't happening, if it's soft war, it can actually have an impact. So for example, visits from the Dalai Lama are an, uh, like a, a soft war uh, atomic weapon, a tactical application in that sense. Then we, of course, have uh, shallow power, which we can see with uh, reality TV um, <laughs> stars uh, going into politics and stuff like that. And uh, also we have deep power, which is actually the debate I think is very crucial for patchworking, because if you build a patch through deep power, I think it's, it will always uh, be an element that uh, the current state's uh, hard and soft power combinations cannot really face, because our politics does not address uh, deep power at all. We are not using the tools of deep power and so on. <clears throat> so I think it is a key to patchwork uh, uh, and uh, deep adaptation is the first step to even consider what deep means because like uh, if it can't help you to adapt to your situation, what use is it anyways? <laughs> so uh, you will find a deep adaptation uh, agenda at, th at this, this uh, link and uh, I'm going to summarize what Jim Bendel is basically saying. <clears throat> we can today address the specific emotional and psychological responses of our current society to data about the ecological bottleneck. So we can actually talk about how people uh, feel about uh, climate change and stuff like that. We can actually find uh, some uh, even emotional uh, analysis that actually can, can seem hard when you look at the data. So uh, the data in question okay, that we are talking about how people react, react to this data suggests a very high probability of social collapse due to unchecked climate change. <coughs> so that's the situation we're at at the moment. And uh, it's very important to, for me, uh, like personally, to uh, mark this moment where we're actually starting to uh, talk about emotions and psychology uh, in regards to the bottleneck. Because, uh, of course, there are a lot of projects, for example, the project where they, where they ask climatologists and uh, people who are into natural science to write their feelings at, in a letter and send it to, to, to this project where they publish these le letters scanned, you know, and you can read how hard it is for people to actually talk, talk about it and to see the data every day. <laughs> so, uh, what's the situation? I really recommend you reading the document, uh, the Deep Adaptation Agenda, from Jim Bendel, but I'm just going to go through this real fast. So, when we talk about stuff, that's the first point, 
when we talk about what's happening, uh, when you read about it in the media, there's usually some stuff mentioned that's supposed to balance how bad it all seems. So when you hear about uh, starvation or something, you actually get uh, another article linked to it real fast, or even it's mentioned in the article to balance the data out, that actually we have these wonderful technologies and engineering solutions that could actually help us. So we get the data filtered, and it's, it's kind of it's pepper and salt in our media stream. It's like the good and the bad. And uh, I think there's a tendency to balance it out without actually acknowledging the uh, situation in itself. Uh, of course, our mitiga mitigation and adaptation agendas at uh, the moment, we already know they're slow. It's like uh, nothing we're doing, doing at the moment uh, scales well enough in the scale that we've been studying it for like uh, a generation, let's say. Let's say. So I think it's uh, too early to say that we do have some solution among the many we already uh, read about and uh, talk about. And uh, we should always keep in mind that it's all still uncertain. Even the solutions that uh, may feel, you know, even without bias and so on, can f and without fetishism, can still be uncertain. Uh, the current reports are the very worst end of the uh, 1990s predictions, which is also very interesting that when you go talk to some of these people, they actually say, okay, we've been studying it uh, in the 90s, and we had this vision of you know, something really bad happening like 30 years you know, from now, and you can hear, uh, hear them now talking about how it's really happening, and uh, the prediction is actually the readout from the, dev the device. Okay. <laughs> which is uh, something that uh, connects to our current carbon capture technologies because it just doesn't scale. It's uh, unfortunate that maybe we, we can have some uh, success with biochar or something, but uh, from uh, the point of view uh, of someone who's trying to understand the scaling, uh, it's unfortunate that we do not have a carbon uh, capture technology at the moment. <coughs> But uh, biological approaches uh, to carbon capture are uh, now a ray of hope, but it's just a ray of hope, okay? But there is an actual ray of hope in uh, the fact that if we start working with nature, if we start planting trees, if we start doing you know, like rain gardens and all of this weird stuff and like polyculture, we could actually uh, you know, have an impact that could actually be helpful. But at the same time, uh, our time is running out in regards to the way plants are already using the CO2. So at some moment, the capacity of the planet will be, will be reached. And we have uh, like very little idea uh, about what it's going to mean, okay? when, it's, when the absorption of CO2 uh, just stops. <coughs> Well, uh, damage to ecosystems is already locked in. We can see that in uh, the fact that, as I talked about uh, my, in my first uh, talk here, uh, we're already living in nature that's been affected by the human. It's an anthropic nature. Even the most remote islands you know, uh, are in contact with the atmosphere and the oceans we have irreversibly altered. Okay? So even uh, like there's no primal nature basically left. There's just different degrees of anthropic influence. <clears throat> and uh, in regards to methane, that's a big question because at uh, one side, some scientists are saying that it's going to have an impact in like a, a few hundred years, like there's, the release will be so slow that we don't have to be worried. But at the same time, there are these crazies, you know, that talk about uh, the clathrates, you know, and how uh, the methane under the ocean and in the permafrost uh, is, can get released real fast with a lot of energy. And uh, they basically call this the, the clathrate uh, gun or the methane gun. So it's so fast, like it's, it's like the uh, pull of the trigger. Uh, but we have insufficient data to actually have like a hard science position on methane. But I think that's critical to understand that the controversy about methane is ongoing and it's a very, uh, very harsh reality if it's true. <coughs> Geoengineering is uncertain. Because like we have no idea how our logistics will look in the future, we have no idea about our agriculture, but we would like to start uh, altering the <laughs> uh, climate uh, on a scale of hundreds uh, of years. Uh, 
So it's, it's uh, very uncertain that the geoengineering will actually have practical uh, applications, given that people will still re rely on rain, they will still need to work with the, river, uh, with the water sources they have and so on. So any uh, additional uh, complexities in the system in regards to geoengineering are more of a risk, for, in my uh, opinion. But Jim Bendel says that it's just uncertain. We have no idea what could happen. <coughs> and of course, there's the tragedy uh, of uh, our current, uh, you know, industrial uh, scholastic system of, uh, or how do you call it? Uh, because like most of our investments and most of our patenting is happening in uh, consumerism and in finance. So uh, I would I would add the drones, uh, phones, and genomes uh, industry uh, into this as well. Uh, because like these are uh, technologies that we just know that they just will not scale and like they're just parasitizing on the current uh, system and hoping that there will be some shift in something that will help them survive. Okay, so I think that's a very important uh, debate because we either have to help them survive or we'll have to let them go as we, we will talk later in this uh, talk. <coughs> So we've talked about the game over debate, which is basically the debate about the situation on the previous slide. And we can uh, actually find some uh, common ground uh, when we encounter the, the debate in various countries and on various media and so on. So the first uh, point of contention that usually happens uh, or seems to happen is that the data itself is seen as a threat. Okay. So as a threat, because like if you learn about the situation, if you accept the facts, it's going to be suffering for you. Okay, so it's not such a good idea to just, you know, uh, publish the research and comment on it honestly as a journalist and so on and combine the power of journalism and science into this movement that tries to show you the reality. Okay, because uh, uh, this uh, rocking of the boat, okay, according to this point of view is dangerous in itself. And we should believe in uh, civilization and nature to actually sort itself out somehow. And not that many people will die to damage us uh, in the future as a species on a psycho-spiritual level. It's going to be okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's the first one. Uh, the second one is censorship due to concern over psychological impact of data on the status quo, on the system itself. So it's, uh, it sounds similar, but it's, it's actually a, di a very different point because uh, they're trying to hold on to existing views of reality. So you're trying to stay inside, you know, uh, basically an, in some type of engineering political bubble uh, without considering uh, the research that's already been done on the impact of the data about climate change on people. And actually the impact isn't uh, destructive, it's, it, it isn't something that makes them hate the status quo, it makes them want to get more involved in the situation, okay? It's not a, it's not a radicalization eco, into eco-fascism, it's just, uh, you know, some type of civic engagement is uh, starting to, you know, rear its ugly head. <laughs> so. Uh, then there's the paternalistic attitude uh, of the experts towards the public. And this uh, happens uh, on multiple levels, but the very basic level is that uh, the expert feels uh, some type of responsibility and account accountability to the way uh, society works, okay? If you're like an honest professional in, in some you know, field where you take care of people or you help them build houses or you, know, you teach them or, or something, okay, you actually want to uh, be, a, be something that's actually uh, not threatening to the people, okay? Because you know that's where, where, when you're helpful. So uh, whatever is happening, okay, the expert will say that you just, we just have to be, we the common people have to be better people. We need to be smarter, we need to work harder, we need to be nicer to each other. And uh, like, it's, it's a very nice uh, attitude, but uh, it's paternalistic or patronizing, okay? And then there's the fourth one, which uh, I think is the silliest one of all, and that's that despair uh, is seen as uh, overall, over, overall inherently unproductive. So like what, it's, uh, it's the new age in hard sciences, I would say. It's the care of uh, something they do not want to talk about, like the spiritual side of humans, the emotional and psychological side, but they still want to take care, care of it somehow, so they don't want people to, be, to live their lives uh, in despair. 
And I think this is, a, uh, in, this is inherently unproductive. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the blood in your eyes theory of uh, culture, that uh, the more violence we see in the right context, uh, the, the better actually we can, we can react to it uh, emotionally. And uh, I think it's, it's a big uh, thing uh, in culture today that this isn't happening in relation to climate change. We, we get Hollywood movies, we get post-catastrophic movies, but we don't actually get you know, some traumatic experience uh, of uh, the collapse, unless we talk about Haneke and people like that, of course. So, uh, this, uh, the research suggests, uh, the psychological research suggests, that despair and uh, the you know, fear of tragedy can actually help people uh, to improve their lives, which I think this is the strongest argument against this, that there actually is research uh, done on uh, how people structure their lives and uh, their overall mental health and so on after they've uh, actually went through uh, a tragedy of uh, this magnitude. <coughs> so, uh, we move on to how we deal with hope and denial because these will be the big emotions uh, when people start talking about this. And we'll have to o overcome a lot of emotional and social blocks, okay? Because uh, we don't want to think about the data uh, some, sometimes, somehow, someone. We don't want to think about it and we don't want to tell other people about it. There's like a very uh, intense uh, you know, uh, line that some people involved in this debate have to make. Uh, if, if you really mention the collapse on the uh, fifth uh, family dinner, if, or if they didn't get it on the first four dinner, family dinners, will you talk about it on the fifth one? <laughs> and there's like this, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how much, how much, uh, you know, uh, energy you invest in this, because like the, the ration, ra rational shields that people in, invent, you just have to believe that there's something else happening. That, you know, this mask of uh, staying, you know, in your place in society, actually something is happening in their minds when you try to, when you, when you honestly try to talk about it and you honestly uh, try to provide enough data to support the view. So, uh, this uh, then goes into uh, three big, uh, what Jem Mendel calls blocks. And the first one is the avoidance of bombast. So, uh, people, uh, when they actually uh, share the data or talk about it, there's a, you know, uh, period of time where you have to stomach it, where it has, needs to metabolize inside you. Or maybe you're writing uh, about it in some uh, newspaper or something, so you need to wait for you to edit it, you know, and think, feel good about it and uh, actually publish it. And uh, during this process, uh, it's, it happens that uh, the data is actually uh, lessened in its impact and uh, you get it late. <laughs> And uh, it's already uh, conservative in the way you, you uh, or the, the authors of these papers and uh, the articles actually talk about it. So it's a different emotion when you actually see the data coming from the ground <laughs> and uh, when you write about it six months uh, later. Okay. And you want to avoid uh, bombast. You don't want to be the guy who's part of this uh, climate breakdown spectacle, who's gonna, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> scream at the United Nations that the, the planet is fucked and so on. You don't want to be that guy. <laughs> yeah. And of course, there's uh, another uh, bottleneck uh, when even people who do understand the data tend to hold back for fear of their own culture, how they could be stigmatized how they could be you know, dragged through uh, conservative media and so on. And uh, there's the, their own social and cultural situation to consider how their children will be uh, perceived and so on. And Jem Bendel doesn't uh, go too deep into this, but I feel that this is a big problem in academia. And uh, I really recommend reading this part if you're in academia. And of course, among the big organizations we have, okay, that are already involved with uh, climate change or some uh, ecological problem, uh, there's always a tendency to look more effective than alarmist. You want to be useful to society as an organization if they're paying you money to be effective. So you move the goalposts, you uh, choose a different PR strategy, uh, you get money from a grant, you know, that's actually about something else and so on. There, there, there's this uh, tendency to stay, stay afloat as a, an organization, even if you just, you're just burning attention and other resources. So, 
uh, this is the framework of framing after denial. <laughs> so uh, when we actually uh, deal with it, okay, which is a long process, uh, we can start considering uh, the frame and the scale of the event that's ahead of us. So uh, ahead of us uh, are like three types of uh, three levels of uh, event. Okay, so the first one is collapse, which you can see as the social one, the reaction of the culture and the economy and so on. Then there's catastrophe, where you get like super storms, you know, and uh, the shores get uh, kind of uncomfortable and so on. And of course, there's extinction. And this is the uh, framing that Bendel uh, is using to change uh, how people feel about this and how they engage with it before uh, we get into the deep ad adaptation agenda. So uh, structuring your uh, view of reality uh, and so society and civilization and nature in a way that uh, point one, uh, some form of social collapse is inevitable, okay? <laughs> point two, uh, some form of global catastrophe is probable. And uh, the, the hardest to stomach is that uh, the extinction of the human species is possible. And like this debate is happening at a level where we are, we are used to academics, uh, younger ones uh, mainly, talking about human extinction, okay? Uh, with uh, meteors, you know, and I don't know, su super virus uh, infections and uh, aliens and stuff like that. But this is like a very different uh, debate. This isn't, isn't, isn't the Hollywood version of it because you get older and more respected scientists talking about what it, what it would mean uh, to see nature change in such a way that it becomes a different planet. <coughs> okay, so some observations about what happens when uh, this uh, framework is applied. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Yeah. So, uh, A, we have to uh, overcome our tendency to choose views that align with our current understanding. Okay, that's our tendency at the moment to hold on to what we already understand, but the, the, the focus uh, should start moving towards uh, encountering the unknown and learning about uh, what's actually happening in the places we did not know about yet. Okay, so this uh, of course applies again to carbon reductionism, okay, uh, but it also applies to a return to deep values alone, because there's this uh, uh, eco-commune uh, tendency and a lot of uh, what I like to call just, you know, the soft uh, green solutions. And even some of the hard ones we, we, we like to talk about, like, uh, I don't know, uh, from meditation retreats to, uh, you know, uh, solar panels and stuff like that. It's all kind of light. It's not something that would scale, that would actually make a dent. So we have to consider that uh, this paradigm that we, we are encountered, uh, we encounter every, every day uh, may already be insufficient and may be a block to, for us to actually talk about what's, what's happening or what we don't know is happening. Of course, B, there may be, may not be <laughs> any way to plan for the collapse. Okay, maybe it's going to ha happen too fast, maybe it's uh, going to change too much lo lo logistics and infrastructure. So it's worthwhile to have a bug out bag for a uh, case of floods and uh, hurricanes, but uh, becoming a prepper in this situation doesn't seem logical given how, how complex the system is. Um, and uh, there's another uh, important point from Bendel that uh, the fo focus on survival skills and building your own uh, community and uh, having these managerial, managerial post-collapse soft skills that you need to keep the community going and so on may not be enough because all of these people are missing the deep adaptation. They're missing the deeper, oh shit. I'm, I'm clicking through it all, yeah. Boom, boom, yeah. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, and the last one is that uh, we need to uh, talk about the collapse as something that's already uh, going. That's what I mentioned in the beginning, that the South is already experiencing it. So there's this famous saying that collapse is just, just isn't evenly distributed, but it's here. So, uh, the interesting thing about uh, the study that uh, Bendel uh, offers is that according to him, Considering collapse as inevitable, catastrophe as probable, and extinction as possible has not led to apathy or depression, okay? 
Uh, rather, this framing opened up the debate about the deep adaptation agenda, which is uh, the uh, tool we'll, we'll be presenting, I'll be presenting on the next slide. This is very interesting because uh, it's already showing again the line that we need to cross to actually engage with the topic. Okay, like, like we have to test how people react uh, to uh, a framework that we're, we're trying to develop. So uh, here, here it is, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, just give me a minute because there's, uh, uh, you know, uh, as I was preparing this uh, uh, lecture or, or talk, I was always uh, thinking that I don't, I m must not speak about this stuff here. I must not speak about that stuff there. And this, this kind of hit me uh, at the moment. So I'm just gonna go through it fast to not to get into, into the uh, ugly stuff. So uh, the first thing is we should, we should probably stop trying to save progress as we understand it today, which is the explosive linear, li linear linear uh, civilization that uh, goes to the moon, you know, and wants to go to Mars and stuff like that and uses a lot of satellites and cars. Maybe that's not the progress uh, category that we should be in at the moment. At the same time, individual psychological resilience will underlie all other activity. So uh, we can only imagine how, what the psychological impact will be. So investing in this will be the most important thing uh, before we get specific impacts of what's happening. Before the, the wave comes, we, have to, we need to already have some type of psychological resilience. And uh, of course, past global initiative goals like uh, the Paris Agreement and so on uh, are not working. Okay, the goals are not being achieved, and it's, it's a very uh, contentious debate, of course, but it, when you, we look at this, we just have to somehow let it go and hope that some other pressure will one day uh, change the government's mind and so on. And uh, the last one, yes. So this is the uh, outline of the deep adaptation agenda itself. And uh, as you can see, there are four of them. And the last one has been added uh, lately uh, in 2019 by uh, Jim Bendel after uh, more debate has been ongoing. So the first, uh, or I'm gonna just go through them. It's resilience, relinquishment, restoration, and reconciliation. And uh, these are applied, uh, each of them is applied like uh, to uh, everything, uh, basically everything in your life, from tools to, uh, you know, uh, situations and your job and so on. It's like uh, resilience ask us, asks us uh, how do we keep what we really want to keep. So there's also a question about uh, why do we want to keep stuff and wh what's the stuff uh, doing for us. Okay, so it's already a very deep question. Relinquishment ask us, asks us what do we need to let go of in order to not make matters uh, worse. So uh, this, of course, uh, goes uh, further than that uh, because we have to, uh, of course, let go of something uh, of our own attitudes and maybe even some values. It's not ju just about uh, getting out of our cars, you know, three days a week and so on. And uh, restoration is about what can we bring back to help us with the coming difficulties and tragedies. And for me, this is a very important, uh, you know, return of the debate of uh, some form of archaic revival and actually effective uh, learning from past technologies and traditions. And I think this, will, this is something that we will see more of uh, in a new uh, form. And the last, the fourth one is reconciliation, which ask, asks us uh, what could I make peace with to lessen suffering at the moment or uh, overall, overall. And this, this one is uh, very important because it, uh, Jim Bendel addresses politics here and he addresses uh, spirituality and I think that that's what was missing in the first uh, formulation. And uh, he even talks about the hate people have, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> to uh, God and uh, mortality itself, you know, and uh, how it's uh, an unfair situation that we're uh, in at this point in uh, history and we have to deal with it somehow. So, uh, these are the main four points and I think uh, it opens up a debate about uh, going further with what uh, Jim Bendel has already offered. So if I get a chance to talk about this more, I, I actually want to talk about uh, ritual and how we want, need to uh, reintroduce some of the old stuff into the new stuff. And I think that's gonna help us with all the other points as well, okay? And uh, here is a, s a summary for you. So uh, considering the basic framework of collapse as, in as inevitable, 
catastrophe as probable, extinction as possible, and the specific uh, deep adaptation outline is resilience, relinquishment, restoration, and reconciliation. And I would uh, actually uh, leave this up for a while for people to look at it. Okay, thanks. The, uh, the stages of grief have been the basic model for this debate for a long while, I think. And it's nice to see something else emerge that sounds like it could work. Yeah. It's uh, different parts of uh, terror management theory. or, um, But it would be interesting to pair something like that with Paul Cheney's model uh, and put a, a kind of a death semblance in that, which we can cover a little bit later. Uh, and we're going to check with uh, Muthir real fast. Just a quick introduction on him. He uh, he's a he's a last minute stand in. Um, he um, works for the or he started the uh, new economy law, uh, and he is also alongside Skino works uh, with the Extinction Rebellion. So uh, we're looking forward with, to getting him on. Uh, it looks like he's online. So just give us a couple minutes. I'm gonna try to hook up with Matthew right now. Yep. Any other specific questions that you would have for audience out here uh, regarding last slides up here? Uh, yeah, like my question w would basically be, uh, how do you reconcile <laughs> uh, this, you know, hobby of uh, yours or ours, uh, which by which I mean the climate breakdown, uh, with other activities in your life, because it has to affect everything. So <laughs> there's this uh, question of uh, what's actually helping. If there's one thing that you really think is helping uh, you to deal with it and uh, talk about it or think about it more. And I'm going to ask Mr. Dustin Breitling right there. <laughs> You're asking me personally. Yeah, yeah. You're addressing this question helps, to me. Dusty, what helps? Uh, well, I, I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think a vast majority of people, including myself, are necessarily. Well, I guess that can also be debatable. I wouldn't say I'm necessarily structuring a mindset towards something such as climate change, but of course, I think there is, uh, you know, there is a prevalent attitude of some kind of uncertainty, whether. We want to use words such as catastrophe, or whether we want to use uh, words as collapse, and so forth. Um, that yeah, I, w I would agree that it's mobilized a certain type of consciousness towards uh, people getting involved in uh, you know doing such things as extinction rebellion. Um, but I, I suppose personally, I, I think that's I would agree that I think that's where it's the the territory that needs to be charted out, especially. Um, considering the fact that, you know, even still these discussions are extremely uncomfortable to have at some level. Uh, and also I think another, another aspect of it is, you know, when we do come to these types of spaces or when we do have discussions about it, I think mindsets and also physiological sets of how we engage with each other and how we're also, I would say at some level, um, uh, kind of incompatible in terms of mindsets when we're approaching these topics, meaning that uh, simply you, if you don't feel comfortable, if you're not in an environment that really tries to make that space conducive to having these discussions or, or you're still having the preoccupation of how something is going to be received, 
then I still then I, I, I still think that's kind of an issue that's especially becoming the problem uh, as of now regarding that uh, we have to get people more and more activate more and more people into that type of mindset so I think it's building up these types of programs of mindsets which I think such things as synthetic zero and uh, the side view and talking about reviewing or re, uh, reviewing these ideas about mindfulness and revisiting them you know not looking at mindfulness in this kind of commodified exchange like you know uh, uh, I don't know diluted form as we see now but mindfulness really in terms of building up practices and building up uh, means and tools and personal resources for that. So I think that's one pathway to, to go down, but I don't think there's a, for me, I don't I haven't established anything quite personal yet. I think it's still ongoing. However, I, 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 I would take a lot of influence from recently delving into, uh, yes, a lot of practices revolving around mindfulness, I suppose. No, the, the mindfulness I think makes sense, uh, but there's there are so many approaches to mindfulness that you can just mention it, and there's nothing uh, like too specific you can say about it. But uh, w what you s said about the incompatibility of uh, the people uh, when when they get into the uncomfortable like on, on, on a kind of physiological, neurobiological register. So like, like we're all because we're all kind of working on different uh, temporal and, and spatial and physiological scapes too. I mean, sometimes uh, just basically thinking about our moods and our emotions and those types of states, and that's what, if anything, the most important conversation could be uh, climate change, or it could be, you know, something such as a debt crisis, or it could be, uh, you know, uh, looking at usage of nuclear explosions, whatever it may be. Uh, but you know, largely, if we're in these kind of different states of mind and different states of approaches, then you're, you're kind of seeing people come to the table or come to the conversation. Uh, that you know they're not necessarily prepared it's not that they're necessarily prepared for it but again it comes back to the conditions yeah I get that like at one level you're saying that like people are, are have a different levels of readiness for the awkwardness and the cringe of talking about collapse but yeah. I think you're actually saying uh, something else as well that there's actually some construction uh, inside the, the psych psycho uh, you know somatic uh, human when they start talking about nature sure. And that affects the, there's like a deeper archetype that gets confronted with it. And there are other people who are witness to this archetype getting, you know, contrasted with this data and, and having to deal with it, right? If that's... Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's, yeah, that's Yeah. So is there anyone else who's ready to... Uh, Igor, I would have a question for you, Igor. Like when people talk about, when people talk about uh, the collapse and stuff, okay? What actually helps you deal with it? What's your, your technique of uh, you know, uh, being able to talk about collapse with people? Because we talk about it all the time, but you know. <laughs> Hello, hey everyone. Well, <laughs> just to say, uh, I just arrived as you can see, but um, I would just say I'm a collapse myself, so okay, I'm okay. collapsing all the time. So, so, so what so can the I? Crisis keeps you going yeah, anyway. kind of. That's my way. So, okay, so that's I I Igor's wondrous inner engine of hate and suffering. <laughs> and uh, is, there, is there another person? Oh, there's uh, Radim Labuda just laughed and he's gonna be so fucking sorry, man. Come on, come on, come on, Radim. Uh, grit one's teeth and do what's best, what you consider best, that's all, that's all. And uh, I, I find that doing practical things helps. It's much better than overthinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just uh, do whatever you uh, whatever you can towards uh, that unlikely goal that it might, uh, in the end, turn out fine. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, that's 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 the uh, radium input. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, would you be would you be actually open to? Yeah. Just drop it in, man. Drop it in. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess I'm processing big time because um, like thinking about your question and the project that I showed at the beginning the farm was 2004 to 2012 and that was completely in response to thinking about these things and it's like uh, spent a lot of time um, and energy in into that and nobody fucking cared mm -hmm. and so then now people are caring which is a huge difference and I'm still processing like, mm. I'm, I'm not quite sure what 
but I kind of like for myself personally, I kind of got got over it somehow and just sort of got uh, thought, well, everything's fucked. No one's listening. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that can be done, but that's changed now, and I'm, I'm figuring it out. It's positive. Hey, it's, it's very interesting for me to uh, hear about that because, like, uh, you're the person uh, who just as uh, Radim has been doing something about it, like trying to to test uh, your own uh, position. And uh, I would actually like to 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 know if you can somehow map where the ears are opening. Okay, which which uh, actually, if, if it's happening in, in the media and what what type of media or what, what where you think it's at the you know where it's breaking up? No, no idea, no idea. Everywhere and nowhere. BBC, yeah, 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 yeah. But but I need to give it because. Yeah, 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 sure. I was actually thinking about um, something that was triggered in your talk about, um, about, I can't remember what the phrase was, but it made me think about um, art and arts, how artists function in sort of trying, or have done in trying to sort of bring awareness to these kind of things. And I was thinking about the impotence of um, something like Olafur Elias in bringing ice from the, the Arctic Circle and putting mm -hmm. it into a city center so people can watch it melt in a kind of abstract way. And I was thinking, yeah, what what really needs to happen is there to be like a live um, video link from the people who are living in that environment, humans living in that environment and what they're experiencing every day mm -hmm. is that being on the front line, like into every city center, like on the the um, big screen on Times Square or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like it's about, it's about um, understanding other people's uh, personal processes in on the front line where it's really evident and really like really happening when people's towns are getting invaded with starving polar bears who are like, trying to force their way into people's houses so they can eat their children and stuff like that it's like that I'd like to know what they're thinking as well so so I think we're actually doing something wrong as uh, you know uh, as a society that we're not sending uh, report like vice news should be following like uh, all the starving polar bears right now okay <laughs> I think that would actually be the content that would actually be serious in this moment yeah, yeah all the rem all the, uh, the the five creature uh, sorry creatures yeah but, but I think that's uh, th that's a uh, good point that that's not where uh, may maybe the uh, maybe the ears have opened that way but uh, the application still isn't there. Like the, the w w maybe we just need processing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How you explain to us like how the media is like still so conservative on yeah. and how our thought processes personally are so conservative about it? Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna hand it to KC here, and we're gonna get other people involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just repeating from Tomash. Yep, Xenogoth is online. Uh, we're going to take a couple minutes while uh, Mothir finds a connection. He's uh, right now in an Extinction Rebellion uh, meeting, so, and they're having an I a Wi Fi issue. But uh, uh, we'll patch in to Xenogoth. Yep.
I think there's 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 a, there's a book uh, called Left Melancholy by uh, Enzo Traverso, which I think is really brilliant on this. And he talks about the way that um, to depathologize melancholy uh, becomes a necessary premise of a mourning process that allows melancholy instead of paralyzing it, that doesn't paralyze melancholy into this collapsed thinking, which sort of takes away um, any active uh, engaging with these problems. Like in the way that I think Paul's been approaching really love, which it was brilliant, um, that that becomes a, 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 in a way that's, uh, that you are actively um, seeking out these problems using the technologies that are available. Um, and I feel like, yeah, I guess the point is that, that, that those two things, I think, are far too easily conflated but I think they should be just understood as very distinct processes. I agreed with that. And I take that time to actually throw in some of my points on that, watching the polar bears themselves. Some things you get out of uh, terror management theory are, are, are quite different than that. It sounds good to face that and see it while, see that uh, image and try to change minds with that, but only certain parts of the population are changed by that. Um, what you have in TMT is, is a difference in that, and people actually fall more towards their in-group, and, and they fall more towards that human uh, categorized in-group. So if you see a polar bear dying and you have a connection with an existential death with that, TMT proposes that a person will be drawn more towards their in-group. So if you like uh, uh, New York uh, Giants uh, basketball team, or uh, ooh, that's bad, New York Giants football team, uh, um, watching a polar bear dying in, in climate change and, and you only have that such capacity to have that idea of an in-group, you're just going to support your football team more, per se. Uh, so, so how do you attach into that and, and get into that existential death uh, and, and allowing that to um, be a nice parasite to populate the, with, with, uh, with that kind of mentality? Like you're, you're, you're proposing to like get, a, get rid of the speciesism in a way, to like uh, get m more invested in the suffering of other forms of yeah. life. Okay, but that's uh, again, that's like, uh, it can, that can be seen as a hippie question, but <laughs> now it can be seen as an engineering question as well, because uh, I, I want to react to, to what Xenogoth was saying. I just want, want to uh, finish this uh, stuff that Casey started. <laughs> And the uh, thing is, uh, when you actually look at uh, the space station, how, how much does it cost to keep a human alive in uh, space, right? So uh, the Earth is doing all of this, uh, all of this uh, somehow, and I think uh, the new thinking actually it doesn't take the th thinking about collapse doesn't take away agency in this in this manner. I think because it tells you that you can do even better if you understand nature better and you respect it and so on. I think that's the key key moment where you actually nature as a, a, a sojourner, sojourner or a partner in reality and start actually applying your knowledge uh, in a biomimetic you know uh, manner but at an industrial scale <laughs> if that makes sense yeah it's like something like uh, doing it like a re real hard you know but uh, real deep <laughs> and <laughs> that if if the axis uh, that I mentioned in my talk makes sense, but uh, I, I'm really interested. Uh, before or Louis, is this a specific to this debate? Yes. Okay. So just something I wanted to. I, I was thinking from your comment, Xenogoth, um, with regards to uh, melancholia, and the way in which there's the expectation that melancholia arises somehow spontaneously with regards to extinction, for example, and we know that the melancholy of extinction has long been a curated experience in the way in which uh, the, the portrayal of uh, uh, various animal and plant species is, is, is often uh, mediatized. And uh, I'm curious as to how, on the one hand, we are encouraged to engage in that sense of spontaneous melancholia uh, whilst we know that uh, corporations and governments have been paying long attention to planning for collapse uh, and so on and so forth uh, in, a, in a very uh, non, let's say, melancholic uh, way. So I'm curious also as to, to how melancholia can be uh, uh, corralled into reinforcing precisely that kind of uh, subjective, in the sense of subjective being disempowering, uh, that is simply 
uh, our almost aesthetic response to extinction. Um, I think, at least for the for your point, and also the point from before that that um, I think that's precisely the tension. Of it. so that's it's it's a uh, it's as much a, as a comment and a provocation rather than any sort of um, suggesting that's a, a correction to be made. I think that it's the at least for it. Uh, it's as if there's two opposing approaches to this question. So the, the from my own research on this on, on melancholia, it's always been the case that to focus too much on the effect of the individual to sort of say, yeah, how much does it uh, cost to allow a human to survive becomes um, such an atomized question that we're kind of, we kind of already ask, and those are the questions that we have that inform a lot of debates that are already going on now. And there's a lot of research that suggests that that kind of thinking only encourages um, mental health issues under capitalism. Um, but at the same time, yeah, you have that 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 in itself provides a social thinking for um, in a way that's depersonalized uh, towards yeah, just getting the numbers right. Um, and yeah, governments do plan for that. Um, but that becomes a, that's that's where that tension lies. I think where you start talking about how governments respond, and then you come to this um, this sphere of uh, self sufficiency or whatever else that um, those numbers do differ at different scales, right? And 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 how a state can um, impose an efficiency, um, I think, is often that's the benefit of patchwork. I think for me that it breaks down those goals that when you have those huge large scale numbers for entire populations. Um, I don't, you know, numbers be kind of become slightly insufficient, and that reason becomes reasoning becomes insufficient. Um, and when you reduce that scale, then you can be more accurate. But then you have to deal with, um, yeah, the imposition of the state, which yeah, it it, it becomes my personal view of why that sort of fragmentation is important and that form of exit, um, allowing those numbers to really work in a way that they don't, as they're put forwards on the systems that we currently have. Great. And Michael, do you still have a point? Michael? Yeah, I could say okay. a few things. Um, I guess I just want to pick up quickly on, on the question that was asked when the de debating was first starting about how are we kind of effectively helping people. I use the word transition, but I guess the, what I would be looking at is how do we help people to deeply adapt um, one of the things we're doing here locally in, um, I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and we, I was a founding member of the, the Extinction Rebellion group here. And so what, are we, what we're doing is we're kind of breaking it up into two, I guess, two divisions of XR here in uh, locally. And so the one division is kind of the traditional Extinction Rebellion direct, direct action kind of group that uh, we're focusing on the three demands of Extinction Rebellion, you know, which are tell the truth, having the government and media tell the truth. Second one is to immediately work towards decarbonization. The third one is to uh, enact a mobilization of, of all governing systems, right? So that's broadly what Extinction Rebellion is about, is, is demanding this. So that's one branch. It's kind of a traditional XR. The other branch that we're developing here is... Um, a set of workshops to help people transition, to help people deeply adapt. And we are directly using the deep adaptation approach, resilience, relinquishing, restoring, reconciliation, to do the, to, to kind of come up with a, a matrix of, of how to do this. So what in your life can you build better resilience to you know, adapt and deal with climate change and, and what might be coming, but also with you know, psychologically and psycho-spiritually adapting as well with the melancholy like you know, Goth was talking about and what you guys are going to talk about. So we use these, these four R's, you know, to kind of come up with lists of things that you can do to increase the resilience, to better help relinquishing, you know, to, to come up with strategies and tactics for restoring and, and how to reconciliation. And so what we're doing is, is we're using this model to come up with workshops. So we're having um, Extinction Rebellion workshops where we're, uh, you know, echo grief 
we have an echo grief group started and we have a transition training where we, we bring experts in for permaculture and for, you know, the different hard and soft skills that you'll need for kind of leaning into collapse. Uh, and that's part of the deep adaptation agenda for us is, is that we're not, you know, the one branch of, of Extinction Rebellion is trying to enact and force the government and enact, uh, you know, changes to the system that is. But the other branch is accepting that we probably won't be successful and that we're, we're really, you know, going hard with the deep adaptation approach and we're leaning into collapse, which means adding coping skills, adding tools, you know, and what we were calling is the deep adaptation patchworking, the work of doing that. So deep adaptation patchworking. And these workshops are designed to help people do that, you know, help people deal psychosocially and spiritually and emotionally, but also how to, you know, how to teach them to trans transition their lives away from high carbon living and things like that. So that how to approach, and I really appreciate you guys bringing it up, was really important for me to hear because those are the things we're doing. And back to another thing that Xenogoth said is that we can't, we can't keep, you know, whether it's from the culture of neoliberalism or just historically in the Western culture, we can't keep individualizing this problem. So a lot of these groups, we are doing what we're calling tribe work, which is helping people build their tribe and help people connecting and networking to other people who a, accept the collapse is coming, have you know some sort of deep adaptation approach, and they have skills and resources that we can rely on and building networks. So, so building communities resilience and helping each other kind of go through all of this stuff and crowdsourcing skills and cooperation and not putting it on, on each individual person that's having to deal with this. And, you know, facilitating this community building, not in the political sense, like, you know, um, not, not building communities of politics, but building communities of living and habitation and co co coping, I guess. I think that's just I, basically what I want to say is in terms of what we're doing on that end from, from our angle. Sounds great. Splitting it with the two groups. Uh, on the on the second one, I'm I'm a little curious if there's no questions out for that. Uh, how you guys do that technically? Do you guys uh, have contingency plans loaded up somewhere so you're not falling into the neoliberal set of uh, of risk management per se? Um, how do you guys uh, maintain that? Uh, maybe I'd say library uh, of uh, tools uh, readily available. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the things that we're really kind of struggling with right now is, is because a lot of us do have day jobs and we're not, and we're, you know, working professionals. I work in the public health system and there's teachers and people who own businesses and things like that. But so trying to get, we're still at the stage of organizing, but we are going to have those resources readily available. Um, and maybe I can talk about this later after we have more questions and stuff, but it goes back to some of the questions I have about um, what Paul was talking about in the kind of in the beginning there um, about algorithmic gardening, which I thought was an amazing presentation and really those tools and that kind of modeling framework is really, really important. But my questions are, are always around scalability and how we're going to maintain systems like that and tools like that when, you know, maybe the internet goes down or, or the internet's co-opted for other purposes for, for um, you know, rescue and uh, disaster management, things like that. So we're looking at doing you know hard copies of books, like coming up with a catalog of basically you know something like the whole Earth catalog, but more practical and how to salvage uh, living spaces and how to make food production locally when you know supply chains fall down and stuff like that. So we're looking at coming up with these these packages, I guess. And, you know, right now, a lot of it's online and, and a lot of it's stored in files and things like that. And I know, um, Casey, uh, you guys have kind of reached out and, and wanted to start kind of building that inventory as well, which is great. And I, and I definitely, you know, we'll show, share all our resources with you guys. But again, it, it needs to be, we need to start thinking about the material nature of being able to disseminate this information and to use these tools. And I think that's a really important conversation that's ongoing, but uh, what we're, we're doing is, you know, again, basically just coming up with, with these catalogs and, and we're going to be 
we have disseminated a few of them locally, but we're, you know, we still need to build our, build our library and build our skills. And as we're bringing people in for these groups, these experts in, we're asking them to contribute to this kind of stack of, of how to, of how to, what, what I would call, you know, the long glide, how to, you know, leaning into collapse for long term and uh, coming up with the various tools. All right. And if you guys want to catch any of uh, Matthew's stuff, or not Matthew, but uh, uh, Michael's stuff online, you can check out Synthetic Zero. Um, br bringing this up and bringing that infrastructure up, I'm really thinking uh, about now we have some parallel movements. Uh, and it's after last Zizek's talk uh, on the yellow vests and bringing that up in the in possible demands uh, going through there, you're kind of building dual structures that are, are bringing together as you said, uh, one's preparing for the other to fail, uh, in a sense. And uh, Zizek's talking about this dichotomy within the yellow vest, as well as Louis brought up the uh, gilet jaune or yellow vest uh, paradigm. Um, but they have multiple organizational structures that that are preparing for both, uh, and they're preparing for both impossibilities that they cannot exist at the same time. Uh, I think uh, adapting some of that um, it follows the principles of Bendel and to a large degree of deep adaptation. So the, the Gilets Jaunes structure is, uh, um, they have a, a large uh, organization for debate uh, and, and whatnot, but as well as putting the resources out there in say PDF files uh, ready to uh, adapt to. Uh, and then everything is can be disseminated simply from the roundabout that they call uh, the headquarters or, or whatnot. So uh, there's a lot that I think we as the XR uh, can take out of the Yellow Vest movement. Any comments on Yellow Vest uh, from Louis? Do you want to? It sounds like, uh, sorry for interrupting you now, but it's, uh, it, it was uh, uh, a very uh, acute observation. I think that uh, does do the Yellow Wests uh, and like uh, Extinction Rebellion, do they really invoke uh, the welfare state of old? Or do they really w uh, somehow, uh, is that what they, uh, when they oppose the corporate state? Are they really invoking the welfare state, or are they already uh, counting on something completely different happening? But I, I understand that goes into the, uh, deeper of, of, of what you said. But uh, at the moment when you, when we hear about these activities, how it's changing, do you see some hope of them finding a different uh, beast to invoke or something? Maybe. My reference to the welfare state uh, has to do with not simply the. Uh, particular situation in France, of course, but in terms of protest as such, protest is always directed against a, a set of circumstances and is directed to some supervening body. In this case, it's the, the government or it's the presidency. And insofar as there really does exist any expectation that this address is going to be received or bear any fruit in terms of real consequences, uh, Macron's resignation or something like that, then it's it's still dependent on that political relationship with a state to act on behalf of uh, the people, uh, to act responsibly to provide the various kinds of uh, minimum min, min, the minimum wage and so on and so forth. These sorts of things that were tied into Macron's uh, initial response, uh, the claimed basis for the protests emerging in the first place, which was a hike on fuel tax. And, and, and so on. So there is evoked in the background an idea of the welfare, of a welfare state, of a benevolent state in one form or another, simply by virtue of protests occurring in this way and in this context. Um, the real threat, as numerous people have pointed out, is that the, the Gilets jaunes uh, threatens to do away with, uh, and has already done away with, the conventional channels by which these kinds of political representations have occurred, the trade unions, the Communist Party, uh, the, the, the Socialist Party, whatever you like. And that in itself uh, seems to be what ties in most closely with the discussion about uh, patchwork and, uh, and uh, you know, creating new, new effective political possibilities. Um. The politique del rond point. Great. Anybody from online want to tune in? Just catching for that. We're still trying. To, we're communicating with uh, Mathieu here, but uh, yeah, nobody. Okay. Any questions from the floor that we can take? 
We'll likely, if, if Monsieur cannot uh, log in for now, we'll play one of his videos for closure, but uh, as far as discussion goes, he might tune in later. Uh, there is that XR meeting going on right now, but we are pretty full on the floor. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Uh, I'll go ahead and transition into Monsieur's video real fast, um, and we can play that for good closure. Uh, and uh, well, there is no closure in this situation. Oh. Uh, All right. We will deeply adapt to the situation. We'll take a five minutes break to hook up the connection issues and set up that video. Thank you, guys. Hello? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Are you Sorry ready for your presentation? No, that's fine. Um, it's going to be um, uh, a little bit uh, off the cuff, but um, I will, yeah, I'll do my best to try and give a sense of uh, what, for me, Extinction Rebellion is in I see. the time frame. Uh, and, and, sorry? Uh, can you uh, give us uh, three more minutes, maybe, so that we uh, announce your presentation to the, uh, our attendees? Oh, yeah, sure. No, that'd be good. Um, give me, yeah, five minutes is good as well. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for minutes. connecting. Who, who, who have you got in the attendee attending? Excuse me? How, who have you got attending? Will I be able to see who's attending? Uh, like, 
on the screen in the Google Hangout. Hi, Matthew. It's, ooh, it's really loud. Hi, it's Casey. Uh, yeah, on the bottom of the screen, you got uh, Matthew James. You got Zeno okay. Goth. Uh, Matthew, I keep calling it. <laughs> Michael James uh, from top, bottom to left. And then uh, Zeno Goth on the right. And you can check out their, even their uh, Twitter. Uh, and then you got a few on the floor tuning in from Prague. So, oh, there you are. Is that, is that yep. you? Sweet. Oh, wow. I can see myself speaking there. That's, yep. Uh, great. Tune in for that. And a few people are out smoking, so we'll be starting very shortly. Great. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. How did the meeting? Are you jumping out for the meeting, or? I'm sorry. How did the meeting go? Are you jumping out for the yeah, meeting? Yeah, it was really good. I mean, it's a whole weekend of uh, Extinction Rebellion national strategy. So setting that concept, what, what the strategy is, getting people involved, workshops. Uh, Nonviolent training, uh, direct action training, um, legal observer training. So really setting up the, the structures by which to get to the April the fifteenth deadline. But I'll mention how, how much should I assume that people know about Extinction Rebellion? Well, we we're part of some of us are part of that uh, group here in Prague as well. Uh, I don't know if you just caught the tail end of Michael, but he was also presenting it from uh, Edmonton, Cal uh, Canada. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you got a few in the room here familiar with it. Uh, it's a different organization here in Prague. Um, I don't know if you are in contact with uh, any of the guys over or from Prague, but they took some of your model and, and brought it here. Um, yeah, the guy, main, main guy great. running it is Arne. Ar I'm sorry? The main guy running it is Arne here. All right, German. Okay. Uh -huh. oh, where's he based in German? Prague. Oh, he's, from, he's in Prague. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's in Prague. Yeah. And you guys are all in Prague, are you? Is this... Yep. Uh, this room that you're maybe catching a little glimpse of is uh, a little collective outside of uh, just outside the city center. Right. And then okay. uh, it's a conglomeration right. of different uh, collectives. Right. Brilliant. It's great to be connecting on internationally. In this yeah, way. yeah. Yeah. We took up uh, Greta's uh, call at the at COP24 that uh, it's better to do these kind of. Um, platforms and panels uh, digitally. Yeah. And, and in space as well, like <laughs> being in place as well and bodily, a uh, bodily presence. Cool. We've got people starting to file in, so starting about two minutes. Okay. Thank you. 
Great. What's here? How are you doing? Uh, good. Yes. Good. There. Cool. We got people, folks filed in. Uh, and we could kick off now. Great. I already did a quick intro for you before, so we can go. Great. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be here joining you all in uh, Prague. Um, just amazing how, yeah, we've got across lots of different spaces and how we can hold ourselves. Uh, like I'm here in London and being responsive to all these technological things as well of joining in space, not knowing exactly who the audience is, and um, but having to bring our, fully ourselves as much as we can across uh, how these digital spaces as well and learning to communicate in quite different ways um, from what I would be used to. Um, so I want to talk a bit about First of all, just where I've been, where I have, where, where I have been, which is the Extinction Rebellion National uh, Weekend. Uh, so I had Roger Hallam, uh, Gail, um, people in the who started up Extinction Rebellion. I don't know how much you know the history of it, but uh, I'll begin by saying the Occupy movement was a very large. The people who were involved um, in the uh, Extinction Rebellion. Um, uh, initiation and that was came from a group called Rising Up and Gail Bradbrook um, who was in that and Roger Hallam uh, uh, very much part of the Occupy movement in England as well and which was also an international movement and that kind of um, that kind of culture I think is is coming forth also in, through Extinction Rebellion about regenerative culture um, being politically active having the one thing that was didn't wasn't in in you could say in Occupy was a set of demands, and that's why the demands are being quite. Uh, we're trying to be very clear on what the demands are in Extinction Rebellion, um, particularly uh, with the climate crisis we're facing, and trying to bring a, a unique narrative to um, beyond, in, in a way, the, the current NGO framing of environmental uh, movement um, of climate change talking more about climate collapse and uh, the adaptation that we will need to have within the next, yeah, the transition we will need to move into that adaptive framework, um, both culturally, socially, um, and ecologically, and economically. Um, so I was in this weekend, which is um, trying to bring the strategy focused on it, towards, and I, if you could put this date in your diaries, if, if, if you're feeling called to join the Extinction Rebellion movement of April the 15th um, and the next few days after that, that's going to be a week of the, the kickoff or the, 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 the building up and um, 
the the epiphany of the movement in a way the first or the biggest step so far the november 17th call out that led to a lot of the articles and so on which um, was the blockade of the five bridges in london led to you know lots of articles in the guardian and lots of um, other articles and we had george mombio also on side and that has built this network which i think many of you or some of you are also in that network internationally i think now it's moved to around 20 uh, some say 25 countries um in a kind of international solidarity um and so we're looking for the big push to happen on april the 15th and the strategy in a way was to set down what what the purpose of extinction rebellion is more clearly for that big push and it's still in process um, over this weekend um, and I'll, I'll, I'll reflect a bit more about the structure as I understand it so far it's always it is changing um, as we speak and evolving so I'll mention a bit about how I see the structure uh, later on in the talk and unfortunately I haven't been managed to get the slides ready as yet so I will forward those sli some slides um, to you guys uh, for um, uh, to the patchwork people and to, to spread out among those in their networks after this talk. Uh, I see the, the main emphasis or main aim of this talk is to really galvanize people in a way internationally to see the need for Extinction Rebellion as a network, both um, in country and in, internationally. Um, and to get that date out of April the 15th to get as many people um, in body, in place, if they feel called to civil disobedience, because the thesis is very much based upon it's a numbers game, as Roger Hallam, who's, who's doing the, his PhD on civil disobedience and what has worked and what hasn't worked, and has built um, the, con the sort of conceptual framework of extinction rebellion into that. Um, and so we need, in England at least, between ten to thirty thousand people um doing uh, what the, the, the civil disobedience to bring the political crisis um, um, of the politicians and those in power not you know, at the, either they take everybody off the streets which can lead to further um, um, adverse uh, media coverage or they leave the people there which will also lead to economic downturn because we're looking to block um, economic uh, blocks on the highways and so on that will lead to that economic downturn. So there's that dilemma that we're trying to lead the, the trying to create on the April the 15th. So a lot of this theory is uh, based, as I am, on, on a book. Um, if I can get the name. Um, Yes, so there's a, you can look, find it online actually, it's called Why Civil, Receive, Why Civil Resistance Works by Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth, um, a short, shorter but, um, online version which talks about um, looking empirically at the evidence of non-violent conflict and, the non, and how, um, whereas some people think conflict, violent conflict is, is better for, for political change, this theory among other ones, which um, Roger has spoken of, brings out the idea, uh, uh, demonstrates that non-violent conflict um, has worked better in many situations for, for political change. And it feels like we're in a situation, if we look at the current um, movements that are happening both in England with Brexit, um, we'll talk more about that, but with Brexit, Europe, uh, in Poland, in, in Hungary, um, Germany even, but the alt-right is uh, becoming stronger, Trump, Russia, there's a huge shift in, politically, in, in what, or breakage, you would say, in, in liberal, uh, in liberal democracy, and the idea of progressive democracy and the, the values that underpin that uh, is breaking down. Um, so within that crisis, there's also an opportunity for I see, the civil society to come together to find a different way forward to actually see what it is, to be clear as to what, what is not working and why it's not working and how civil society can be an agent of change 
um, rather than trying to push corp at the moment it seems that mo most of the movements have been about pushing corporations and telling corporations they're not doing the right thing and the campaigning against corporations or campaigning against governments to do the right thing and where I think uh, Extinction Rebellion makes a difference is that it is seeing that the agent for change is actually in us ourselves in citizens coming together as civil society as a civil society movement to bring as a the change that is needed and this for me comes from uh, this idea of moving of, of civil society as an agent for change uh, came because my background is as a lawyer and i was at a conference at king's college uh, a year ago and it was called about transnational justice and um, that co conference was about how we need to, the framing itself, you can say, of nation states came, came out from the religious wars of um, the 17th century within Europe and um, actually, that was, yeah, Germans influenced with Martin Luther, with his pinning of uh, Protestantism, the, the rebellion, you could say then, against the the, the, the paradigm of power then, which was very much church, the, the institution of the church or it was at the center of power and the state and the conflict that was arising there, which then led to the treaties of Westphalia, um, or the Treaty of Westphalia, uh, about, which, which brought the concept of national sovereignty or nation of statehood of a, a, a nation body having sovereignty over its soil. And that concept of statehood, you could say, still carries on. Um, and we have the idea of international law, so the law between states, inter, and what the transnational conference is trying to do is trying to break down and interrogate the concept of do, do we need to think, can we think beyond just the state and uh, um, the, the idea of the state to look at where else are sites of agency arising that can break down that concept. And I suddenly saw the link then with you know, what is happening in the work that I've been doing about civil society against fracking, against uh, the extinction of the species and not and, and life itself on earth arising and civil society wanted to come together as a side of agency um, that moves to the language of transnational democracy so you know having to think clearly about what it is that we thought was good in terms of representative democracy and why that isn't working anymore why people are moving against that even subconsciously or in, in, our, in, in what is, as if we haven't yet come to a theory of what, what it is, and there are many different theories arising as to why we have a post-truth world, why it is we, um, why the old right is rising, why demagoguery is able to take hold of the fear that is arising in people's body and say it's about immigration and why so many people are moving in that direction and how we can create an alternative narrative that is much more, which can be as powerful and can draw in people who feel uh, who were within the liberal democracy but were seeing that that isn't working anymore and that for me actually comes a bit towards i was looking to do some research on patchwork and it's kind of where it comes in its theory it seems that digital nomadic kind of life or livelihoods and digital networks is something that it uh, is very much uh, into and i'm not digitally very uh, agile, but I see something within um, how the ability to spread information horizontally and vertically uh, and give agency to people in their daily lives has led to a situation where representative democracy, the idea of one person representing in parliament a group of people in a place is no, is no might have functioned at a time when information couldn't spread very quickly. Uh, uh, and so one person representing somebody for the whole country um, in, in Parliament might have worked. But now the body itself, the, you say the, the body of citizens, is shifting much more quickly because the uh, information spreads by means and so on in a much faster, in, uh, in a much faster way. But we need to think of systems um, that can handle that amount of information in a coherent way and brings legitimacy back uh, or brings legitimacy to those people who are sensing the need and the desire for more agency um, in their daily lives and experiences of their lives. 
um, which goes to the heart, I think you can say, of um, neoliberal um, economics. There was an article in The Guardian um, which influenced me in my thinking a lot, which said it was the sort of, let's say, the enlightenment thinking about the individual, the pursuit of the individual um, as being the core of what makes society work. Um, has led to the uh, uh, it's led to the problem that we can't even imagine it's the kind of civic conscience that is required for that kind of movement that we say in the 60s the civil rights movement where you get so many people on the streets to act in, in concert and, and in coherence in body um, so the individuality or the individualism uh, needs to be counter managed with you know, what what is how do we actually share our lives and our, move to a sharing economy um, and as, to build back a civic conscience that we are not just individuals random within this world but that we have there is the possibility of a of a lived experience that is uh, collective collective. Uh, and I, I was actually in Bangladesh recently with my parents uh, from there, uh, and I was seeing a sign actually, uh, an advert, and it said something like um, some food thing, and it said the line underneath it was so good you would love to share. And my sister perked up, you know, um, you know, if it was in England that would be the opposite, it would be something like so good you'll you'll not want to share. And it just for me went to the heart of you know, this different different ways of looking at life. Like how do we? perceive uh, this opportunity is for me of society as we see it breaking down being how do we want to reshape ourselves and how, how what is it that is being called from us to, to reshape that um, and that goes also to the heart of the language we use so for example environmental law is very much shaped around the environment the, the framing is seeing the environment as part of the economy so the environmental law isn't is seen as a subset of the economy whereas we need to move to an ecological framework which sees that the economy itself only emerges out of the ecological um, and it, it, it's a deep fundamental shift in how we perceive and conceive of ourselves in the world and how we then we structure ourselves within that um, and i see what extinction rebellion is trying to do you know, both in its civil disobedience, but on its, in its interactions, in its desire to create the local groups that have autonomy and a decentralized network. The beginning of that kind of um, framing, not in necessarily just in theory, but in the practice. So through the practice of doing it, we begin to understand and see how we, uh, like an act in uh, a do and think tank. Um, and that's what's emerging. So, so I was in the meeting just even today, and somebody had on their desk the book by um, Bookchin around social ecology, um, the ecology of freedom. I think it's called. I've been um, wanting to bring that those concepts into um, some of what is uh, Ex Extinction Rebellion is doing. Uh, as in, the, I see a lot of alignment between uh, Bookchin's thinking around social ecology. Um, and what Extinction Rebellion is doing. And my own framing came from more of a deep ecology perspective. Uh, Anna and Ace and uh, Schumacher College and Satish Kumar's kind of thinking around um, an earth jurisprudence is putting the earth at the center of how we, uh, and our relationships to the earth at the center. But where I'm beginning to see the lack or the um, uh, the challenge that was there in deep ecology or what was problematic is that it didn't engage in the political question of how power is shared and um, you know, what, what is the nature of power. And I think social ecology faces that a bit more clearly and enables um, us to see that, or those who get involved to see that we have to frame our problems socially as well, that unless we act uh, well to each other socially and have um, a social ecology, then we're not going to achieve the understanding of how we can relate to the earth in an ecological way. And 
So that brings me then to the systems of Extinction Rebellion because that is how it's trying to frame itself under, you know, it's not necessarily using the social ecology framework at the moment, but I can see it is that that is what is surfacing and how it's framed. So it has um, six core groups um, nationally at the moment, um, which are the political strategy group, which I'm in, um, the movement strategy, like how, how the movement, what is the meaning of the movement and how it will uh, bring that meaning out into um, the people who are supporting it uh, and within it. Um, the action strategy group, which Roger Hallam is in, and that is very much around how do you create actions that will lead to the crisis, or lead to the um, uh, to enact the, the the political dilemmas that will shift into uh, the tipping point of um, social change, of political change. Um, then it also has international solidarity group, which uh, great to link whoever is in here uh, and wants to with with that um, with that group, um, because that is one thing that is very much part of Extinction Rebellion is also to get the voice of the global south as well as economic speaking internationally. That a lot of the suffering that will be felt by the extinction or by climate collapse will first be felt so that on those 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 edges of our human civilization um, in in the Maldives and those islands states um, so we're working very much um, trying to bring that voice in and we have an international lawyer who um, on the group and she was at the cop talks in uh, Poland and uh, I think Extinction Rebellion did get quite a good voice out there actually by doing the same thing of civil disobedience and has brought the beginnings of an, what is called an emergency coalition um, to try to bring that the necessity and the truth because people aren't being told the truth and that is the first demand of extinction but it's had that truth told of that we are facing this uh, collapse within the next uh, 12 years and we have to take action within the first two to not reach those tipping points um, so for those so within those systems we can say of extinction rebellion there are then our subgroups so then we are trying what excites me about Extinction Berlin is that, for example, on today, we, we did say, we had a just a quick mapping to see where people were from, where, where they had come from. And we had, there were local groups that set up in the north of England and Durham. We had people from Wales. We had people from the southeast of England and southwest of England, where I'm from, in Cornwall. So there were lots of, the, the, the movement is spread in place. And I think that's really important to get the democratic legitimacy. But, we are trying to achieve within Extinction Rebellion. It's not just a top-down movement to be a campaign group to lead to collapse. It is there to be a transitional force as well to say that this is how we can see ourselves being regenerative among ourselves and our culture and how we treat each other uh, and telling the truth about how we are within each other and give autonomy to those local groups. Just uh, in some way similar to what's I, mean, I haven't explored what's happening in Rojava very well, but that has also been a bit of inspiration to see that in emergency situations like in Iraq, the Kurdish people have come together to give empower women and to set up community groups that have that, the practice of deliberative democracy and decentralization in their structures, and that it can be done. And what feels quite important to me is that the United Nations, when I was watching this film called The Accidental Anarchist, and he was uh, the diplomat there, um, Kana Ross was saying that he was just troubled that the United Nations are not, is not even giving a voice to that, even though it is the most democratic cons way of practice that he has seen in his, dipl in his diplomatic career. And that just goes to show how the current structures are so embedded in a way of working, a way of being that does not, that invisibilizes civil society and only gives attention to um, the corporate structures and um, to state bodies um, that are existing, which are very much caught up in a power di dynamic, which you could say, some would say is uh, patriarchal and, uh, or power over, maybe a better word, a power over structure 
and that we need to move to more of a power with structure where we give power to each other in autonomous circles. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to finish on some questions uh, or some, um, yeah, so just to summarize, especially for this group, like the next stage is April the 15th, and I would uh, recommend people coming on board if they would like to through the Extinction Rebellion website, and there is a process by which people will be brought on board. There is also something, there is also a very good um, structure set out on Basecamp. So once you join, you get in, you can get involved in subgroups and groups within the base camp uh, ecology um, and take uh, take a role within that. So I recommend those two things. And if some there's anybody within the, this um, patchwork group who would want to be linked in with the international solidarity subgroup, uh, uh, sorry, solidarity strategy group, then I can link them up with that person. Uh, and then just to say, th these are what I see as the threats and opportunities that Extinction Rebellion is dealing with. Ex the main one, of course, is planetary collapse. And what we are calling for is planetary integrity. This was a word I, I, that we have an expert panel advising as well, who are people who are just really behind us. And one of the, those persons is Kate Brower. Um, and she has written a book called Donut Economics, and she has been looking at you know economic structures for the 21st century. And she came up with the word, and I love the, the concept of planetary integrity because it's not looking as to the theory of what's gone on behind. It's saying look forward to how do we achieve not state integrity or you know by country by country or looking at international bodies, but planetary integrity. What is it? And that integrity is calling forth an individual moral integrity in ourselves towards civil and social integrity towards then planetary integrity that fractal pattern that it has to start both within ourselves our own integrity moving forward and into wider and wider systemic circles to the planet the other threat is the alt-right and the opportunity there is to for me is to is to actually look at what some of the some you know some people are saying that there is a, a breakdown, I would say, in the epistemology between what we in the Enlightenment world had as the Cartesian duality between um, fact and knowledge and feeling. And even now I see in some liberals are saying, you know, we've got to move, move back away from feeling and get back to fact and empirical the evidence. And I'm saying that there's something around this about feeling, around giving knowledge and, and, and legitimacy to collective feeling, but not to the shadow feelings that may overtake us, the, the reactions and the fear, but the feelings of, you could say, the, the larger, the ones that can overcome that, uh, what some would say is the feeling of agape or the cosmic love or the wider love that we hold, uh, um, that moves beyond just the individual desire, but the, the love within society um, that is the spiritual truth you could say behind Gandhi and behind um, Ma uh, Martin Luther King's movement that spiritual or social justice that switch spirituality for social justice you could say um, that kind of love that we need to move to and see the opportunities in a narrative that can speak to that um, so yeah those those are the sort of questions and, and the thoughts I might leave that talk at, uh, at leave, leave you at. I think I've reached the end of the time. It's six o'clock uh, here in the UK, but I'm open to questions as well. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Um, but you have from there uh, building that yes from a planetary perspective and we even looked at something like uh, the the international or the uh, 
the planetary um, file system structure. So, so building things out of uh, protocols with that. So, um, I'm gonna bring it in here. It looks like uh, you're in nice Blade Runner setting uh, cafe with uh, post-apocalyptic right here. So we, we don't want to take too much time for you. Does anybody have direct questions for Moth here? Or, or would like to answer one of his questions that he came up with? Online? Michael or Matthew? Great. Do you have any questions from our organizing over here? And the, and the patchwork infrastructure, I like how you brought it in as well. Is that, from, is that to me? Yeah, Matthew, yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in, in what you, when you say you've brought in uh, some of the uh, my, uh, blockchain thinking into the structure, into patchwork structures, like how, how do you see that? Uh, how do you see that uh, evolving? Um, what is, you know, what, where do you see it? What, where do you see what you're you are trying to do? Where do you see that going? Uh, we saw it as a as an infrastructure uh, situation. So we we looked at infrastructure from the start. Uh, we do have competing models that come up with how a patchwork can work, uh, and already primed for kind of post sustainability uh, life. And as as uh, Michael was going over with how his. Um, chapter is, is broken up to in uh, Edmonton, uh, building two counterposing uh, organizations that um, one is planning for the other's failure in a sense. Uh, so, so already past post collapse and post politics on that side. And one is, is still working within politics. Uh, you guys have a much more robust structure with how many layers there are to that. Um, we're hoping from Patrick's side and, and even exploring more on the weirding side of that, um, as you were going into some part of the spirituality, they're going to that. We had a speaker before just speak about uh, integration of spirituality into that. Um, we're building from that, that ground up, and then we're also working with Extinction Real and Local, I guess. But uh, April 15th, yeah, is a, is a date we'll put on our calendars. Yeah, great. Great, yeah. No, I, I really yeah, see this kind of link between, I don't know what the word is, but soul and technology as in how th there is because i was um watching a talk with yuval harari um and sam harris so yuval harari is talking about uh with his uh, homo deus book about how algorithms uh, how we thought we had something called free will but that we don't actually have that and so because the algorithms uh, are demonstrating that they know they can work out what we uh our choices before we've actually made them and uh, it's, it's a deep question there about uh, whether there is something within human conscience which is outside of uh, the algorithm, if you could say, it, whether it is the next level of Newtonian sort of dynamics of, of determinism has now reached another level of computational determinism. Um, and um, yeah, it's about which side you, you go on because um, I, I, I see that, you know, that, that with, with with the opportunity with technology is to also see or to, to bring forth what is uniquely human as well. Um, in in um, the Declaration of Universal, uh, the Declaration, Declaration of Human Rights, when the UN was set up after the Second World War, the uh, first article, you know, you had all these countries trying to agree what it is that's fundamental to hum humanity and to what it is to be human after the suffering of so many people over, you know, over that time. And they said, uh, human beings are endowed with reason and conscience as the two fundamental attributes of being human. And that word of conscience, so with reason we understand, I think, better than conscience. Is that, well, what is, how do we bring forth our conscience into our actions is something I think that's the spiritual angle I want to bring forth into the regenerative culture, that there is a moral aspect that uh, we need to figure out a bit better. Great. And are you guys working with anybody in like New York City or uh, what's the second biggest uh, group that you guys are working with? In, in internationally? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I think the US has the most groups, and then 
I think it was New Zealand has also got quite a lot of groups there as well. Um, and Europe, Germany, Germany has quite a few groups too set up, but um, th there is, I think, quite a lot of autonomy between the different countries with their different needs. In and it's um, yeah, each each is seems to be setting up in different ways. Um, but yeah, so the International Solidarity Group will be looking at how to listen and see what is happening in those countries so that we can try to demonstrate solidarity with, with, with those countries as well in, in, in yeah, their needs. Great. And for resource sharing, XR or uh, extinctionrebellion.org? Uh, yeah. I think it's .org. Um, and you can sign up there. Uh, I think it's Rebellion Earth, actually. Uh, rebellion.org uh, rebellion okay. we'll look through that I'm sure with our local chapter they're already working uh, internally rebellion.earth and, uh, yeah, and then onto the base camp and then there's mm -hmm. uh, lots of information but it's um, great to connect with you and uh, to it'd be good to pull in some of more of that knowledge that you have around um, around you know networks and, and decentralization that you I've built to see how that kind of fits in. I like your approach where you're going with a heavy governance approach and working with the governance in that side. So, um, yeah, yeah that's, that's where we're trying really with uh, implementing certain technology or infrastructure that's decentralized to be able to, to build into a, a clean governance system. Self governance. Yeah. yeah. Great. Cool. There don't seem to be any questions on the floor while Mathieu is here. Anybody on that? All right. We, we don't want to hold too much of your time, and especially that meeting's still going, uh, and you guys are building up momentum right now. Um, <laughs> if there's any last uh, things you want to say, Mathieu, we can. Uh, but if not, we'll let you go. And uh, we really appreciate your time and working through some of the troubleshooting with Wi-Fi and getting through to get a connection. So, um, No, I just um, thank you for, uh, for listening and uh, uh, for hope something of that might might uh, trigger some thoughts and uh, and some feelings. Um, the only thing I noticed actually was uh, this uh, two dash. What is it? Two dash and a semicolon. The, the sign. It's got this two dash. Ah, slash dash backslash. Yeah. Cluster. Yeah. No, I, I I'm just seeing that when you reflect that the other way around, and you've got both. It's almost like the extinction rebellion sign of the, <laughs> the, the, the the time going out. Yeah, the, uh, it it is accelerating <laughs> shapes uh, as we speak. Uh, so even. Patchworks itself is a conglomeration of multiple collectives in the same work. So great. I, I think uh, yeah, we'll have to uh, adapt that logo and uh, and co-opt it. Maybe turn it green as well and <laughs> add a little bit of Green Lantern background to it. And yeah. Um, think right. existentially. Will that trigger any of the existential death that we were talking about before? Or <laughs> maybe a skull, <laughs> memento mori in the logo. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. I don't mean to. Yeah. Brilliant. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. We'll stay on for a little bit more if there's other discussion, Michael, James, or uh, Xenogoth, do you have any questions, anything you want to add to that? I think, Michael, you had some good points about your own section uh, and building the infrastructure for that, so it's great to hear uh, for that. And we will close if that is the uh, ending part. Thank you guys for uh, your patience going through it. And we'll take a uh, discussion offline now for anything else. Thanks.